order. It's the regular meeting of the City Council of the City of Cottonwood, Arizona, held October 20th, 2015 at 6 p.m. at the Cottonwood Council Chambers Building. Deputy Clerk, please take the roll. Councilmember Pratt? Here. Councilmember Dowling? Here. Councilmember Alinsky? Here. Councilmember Howergy? Here. Councilmember Garrison? Present. Vice Mayor Pfeiffer? Here. Mayor Jones? Here. Wow, we're all here. That's wonderful. Thank you. Fantastic. So, Pledge of Allegiance. Who would like to do the Pledge of Allegiance tonight? If no one volunteers, I would call on Roger. Because he's right on the corner and it's easy to get there. The next item is a brief summary of current events by the mayor, city council, or the city manager. <clears throat> the public body does not propose, discuss, deliberate, or take legal action on any matter brought up during this summary unless the specific matter is properly noticed for legal action. <clears throat> Mr. Bartosh. Madam Mayor, council members, just a couple of quick items. Uh, just a reminder, uh, to the council and the public that uh, the fall carnival is planned for the end of the month, uh, sat Saturday, October 31st, to coincide with Halloween. And that'll be located back uh, uh, behind City Hall at the Old Town Activity Park. And also the Old Town merchants will be having their annual safe Halloween event so the kids can trick or treat safely in Old Town. Also, uh, mark your calendars for our annual Walking on Main Street event, which will be held on uh, Saturday, November 14th. And that's it, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Council members, Mr. Pratt. Yeah, first of all, I, I just want to piggyback on the Walking on Main. Really do mark your calendars because we have a great event. We have classic cars. We have a lot of the wineries. We have music. We have artists. We have a historic home tour. There's all kinds of events going on that day. Um, today, I had the honor with the mayor to sit in a very large room with at least 100 third graders from Mountain View Preparatory School who are interested in learning about city government. And I was impressed with how well behaved they were. I was impressed with the quality of their questions and their interest. And also, I was impressed with the dedication of the teachers and interestingly enough, one of them had taken four classes from me at Yavapai College and had been an honor student and went on to get her degree. And to me, it was an example again <coughs> of the positive influence the college can have in the community. So that's always great and it brings it home to me. Um, as well, there's another event going on this week. And you know, out in public, in a small town, people talk to us about who we are and what we do. And I get a lot of questions about the college. And it occurred to me in talking to people that some people in the community didn't know we had an art gallery on the Verde campus. Well, I talk to people about all the things we do try to do for the community beyond classes. And we have a wonderful art gallery. And this Thursday, we have a closing on a show called Layered, Layered Cadences. And the three artists from California will be there. And it's free. And there's always snacks. And again, it's, it's another service that we provide to the community. And then later on in October, we'll have a juried student exhibition. So I invite you to come up to the college, check out our gallery, check out our art shows, and just kind of mingle around. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, council members, anything else? I'm, I'm, I will. Uh, okay. The uh, Verde Valley Advisory Committee for Yapai College Governing Board We'll be having an, a regular meeting tomorrow morning at the college in Clarkdale, I believe in M137 at 8.30 to 10.30. You're more than welcome to show up. And we will be having also our first town hall event uh, hosted by Sedona tomorrow night at 5.30 and it'll go till whenever everybody gets done talking. Um, it'll be basically uh, 
our way of getting into the community, find out what the community expects from the college, and, and uh, people give their feedback back to us on what they expect or what they would like to see. So if you have a chance to attend either of those, I invite you to both. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, so since we last met at a, not a work session, but a regular session, I attended a flag raising at the Veterans of Foreign Wars post 7400 in honor of Operation Enduring Freedom. And the U.S. government used the term Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan to officially describe the war in Afghanistan. And that was for a period between October 2001 and December 2014. So we also attended the Vice Mayor and I and I'm not sure anyone else was there. We attended the Youth Center Grand Opening, and that was very interesting. I thought it was very nice. I mean, our staff just went above and beyond. That building just sparkles. I mean, it looks like you could eat off the floor or the walls. It's so very clean and, and nice. And they were starting their first class, an after-school class, that next Monday. And that was October 12th. And it's housed at 2015 East Pima Street in Old Town, the Old Boys and Girls Club, behind City Hall. And the new location has more room for arts and crafts, games, homework, time, and outdoor play. And the um, Cottonwood Recreation staff offers quality programming and a safe, friendly environment for children in grades one through eight. Children learn positive behaviors and explore their unique talents. It also includes arts and crafts, homework help, swimming, games, outdoor play, and so much more. So if your child would like to attend the Cottonwood Youth Center, contact the Cottonwood Recreation Department. I also um, welcomed a room full of Arizona um, Association of Economic Development members at the Cottonwood Recreation Center, and they met all day last Friday. From there, I ran over to the middle school to judge the quilt show, and there were just so many amazing quilts made by local artists, and it was really hard to decide. I, I spent three hours there <laughs> and looked at each and every one, and the one that um, I finally chose, there was a Route 66 one that was so well done and it was gorgeous, but I did choose the quilt that was entered by Mary Beth Rosetta, it was an amazing quilt that had the brands of Yavapai County ranches on it and the names of the ranch families. And it was just so perfectly done and so beautiful. So that was the one that won. Um, later, um, I met with Cody Bell, and he's the new executive director of Young Life. Young Life is a faith-based organization that wants to work with the community youth, and their, their philosophy reminds me a lot of Kids at Hope. It's about there's so many children and youth that don't even have one adult that they can talk to, and just having an adult in their lives um, as they, they practice at Mingus Union High School makes all the difference for these kids. A lot, uh, the big brothers, big sisters kind of goes under that theme also. But Cody Bell, is he and his wife are living in Cottonwood, and she is a teacher at Cottonwood Oak Creek School District, and the vice mayor happened to meet him when she was walking through the building. On Saturday, I was invited to attend the volunteer luncheon for the Coconino National Forest, and I talked with the Red Rock Ranger, um, Nicole Branton. I don't know if any of you have met Nicole. She's quite an amazing young lady. And I also got to meet the new forest supervisor, and her name is Laura Jo West. And this event is for volunteers of Friends of the Forest, steward of, stewards of public lands, and others. Um, they're really impressed with our Verde Front process that we're working on. Um, they really like not having to go to 12 trail meetings. They can come to one meeting, and so they're extremely supportive of this effort. Um, later in the evening, I was invited, and also um, Councilmember Ruben Houdegui attended the Golden Cobra Kickboxing and Boxing Tournament held in the parking lot of Vinny's Pizza. And this was pretty much for the retirement of Richard Williams, and um, Mr. Haldeke might want to make some comments, but they've been friends, as I understand it, for probably around 20 years, and you've been a big supporter of his. And he's just done amazing things with the youth of our community. Exactly, yes, I've known Richard for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. When he was first uh, competing in, uh, himself in, in the kickboxing endeavor, 
uh, approached me a number of years back and uh, wanted the, uh, to open a gym of his own, started in the basement of the Boys and Girls Club, uh, outgrew that, went to another building out in the industrial areas. Behind uh, the Senior Center? Yeah, back there. there. It was kind of a somewhere. funny little way to get back there. Yeah. We got back there, and uh, the program grew. Um, ended up in the old uh, Steve Corey uh, uh, car dealership uh, building there in the corner across the street from my salon. And uh, once again, it grew there. He promoted many, many, many events. Traveled many miles with the kids from this community. Uh, as far away as Florida, Nevada was uh, common, uh, California. His events uh, attracted people from California, uh, Texas, New Mexico was a heavy supporter, and of course the uh, Arizona region, uh, Phoenix, uh, Flagstaff, and, and locally. But his interest was always in the youth. I think he's, uh, he, he is an amazing young man. He works hard. Uh, he does have a day job, and uh, his spare time was all uh, dedicated to the youth of uh, the Verde Valley and such. So. Quite a, quite a good guy, turning 57 uh, grandkids that he wants to spend more time with, so we're going to fold up the nonprofit and uh, he's going to move on. But uh, he, he had a very positive impact on, on the kids of the Verde Valley. So thank you very much for sharing that, and it was a great honor to be able to be there and talk about all of his... Um, all of the, like the Verde Valley Medical Center's Fit Kids program gave him accolades. I mean, even different nonprofits, but even Joe Arpaio had written him a letter about his work. And so it was our honor to be there to support him, and he is retiring now. But don't have any fears, because he introduced me to a new gentleman who is doing um, Disc Golf, so Disc for Kids is the name of his business, and he's talking about wanting to work with kids and disc golf, so we'll see what happens with that. I attended the Middle Verde Water Advisory Committee meeting in Clarkdale on Monday, and the USGS gave us a report on stream measurements that they have made. They've been measuring up above um, Clarkdale about 11 miles and uh, just seeing what's coming out of streams and, and getting into the river. Today I met Jerry Strande, Strande of the American Legion Post 135 in Cornville, and they're doing a children's and veterans clothing drive. So you can drop things off at Annie's restaurant if you would like to share anything that someone else could use. And the owner of Annie's, Trina, was also there for that. And I, I, again, my ending statement was that um, Councilmember Pratt and I met with quite a few third graders, and you're right, they were just amazingly bright and well-behaved. And their teachers were quite organized, so I really enjoyed that. And that is my report for tonight. So moving on to the next item, are any other items for council members that you've thought of? <coughs> Introduction of new employees. We have Tim Rhoda and Clifton Brown, wastewater operators <coughs> in training. Ms. Bright Brights. Good evening. Madam Mayor, members of the council, I'm here tonight to introduce to you the two newest members of the Utilities Department Wastewater Division. This is Tim Rhoda and this is Cliff Brown. Both Tim and Cliff accepted their operator trading positions and started working for the city in June of this year. Um, Tim has lived in the area most of his life and he's graduated from Mingus High School. He has a strong background in construction. Cliff also has lived here most of his life and graduated from Mingus High School and has a mechanical background and holds a CDL license. Each of these gentlemen have proven that they are hardworking, dedicated, and eager to learn. They get along well with their coworkers and have already pr proved that they're a valuable member of my team. To attest to their eagerness to learn, both Tim and Cliff have successfully already passed their grade one wastewater certification. Congratulations. <laughs> no easy feat, right? Yeah. <laughs> a lot of studying. And I look forward to watching them continue to enhance their skills and knowledge. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Have any words of wisdom for us? <laughs> no, thank you. Huh? Scared them. No, pu they were no very public. Scared to come no public <laughs> speaking required. Thank you so much for coming to serve the citizens of Cottonwood and helping this be a better community through your service. We appreciate you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The next 
items are two proclamations. The first is proclaiming November 7th, 2015 as Veterans History Project Day. And we have Jolene Pearson with us um, tonight, I think. Is Jolene here? Maybe not. She was going to be here. But anyway, we'll go ahead with the proclamation. Whereas the United States Congress created the Veterans History Project in 2000 through Public Law 106-380, and whereas the Veterans History Project collects, preserves, and makes accessible the personal accounts of American War veterans so that future generations may hear directly from veterans and better understand the realities of war and military service. And whereas local Cottonwood veterans and their families and our community have benefited from this opportunity. And whereas the Veterans History Project volunteers will host a midday event on November 7th, 2015 to honor and thank project participants. Now therefore, I, Diane Jones, Mayor of the City of Cottonwood, Arizona, on behalf of the Cottonwood City Council, do proclaim November 7th, 2015, as Veterans History Project Day in Cottonwood. In witness thereof, I have hereunto set my hand this 20th day of October, 2015. And if you are a veteran, would you please raise your hand so that we can recognize you this evening? Thank you all very much. And we have Council Member mm -hmm. is also a veteran. Thank you for your service. Thank you. We appreciate you all. Okay, the next one is Cities and Towns Week. Whereas the citizens of Cottonwood rely on the city of Cottonwood to experience a high quality of life in our community. And whereas cities and towns in Arizona work 24 hours a day, seven days a week to deliver vital city services such as water and sewer utilities, fire, police, and emergency medical response to ensure safe communities. And whereas cities and towns in Arizona also provide services and programs that enhance the quality of life for residents such as parks, utilities, street maintenance, sanitation, and recycling services, libraries, community centers, and recreational programs. And whereas it is important for Cottonwood to continue to provide the excellent delivery of services and programs that our citizens have come to expect in our community. And whereas it is one of the responsibilities of Cottonwood officials to ensure open and accessible government through frequent communication with citizens using various avenues and means. And whereas through participation and cooperation, citizens, community leaders, local businesses, and municipal staff can work together to ensure that services provided by the city of Cottonwood can remain exceptional elements of the quality of life of our community. Now therefore, be it resolved that the city of Cottonwood joins with the League of Cities and Towns and fellow municipalities across the state of Arizona in declaring October 18th through 24th, 2015 as Arizona Cities and Towns Week. Okay, awards. Is there anyone here from, um, from the Tilted Earth Music Festival tonight? I, I don't think that we have. Um, we're going to just go ahead and table this presentation until the next meeting because I guess they were not able to be here tonight. So we'll table that. Presentations. Brief update on Yavapai College by um, Dr. Penny Wills. President was supposed to be here, but we have James Perry, <coughs> who is the executive dean. Is that your title? Correct. Executive dean. And this is Dr. James <coughs> Perry. He recently attained his <coughs> doctorate, and congratulations on that. Thank you, Mary. Job well done. Yeah, booted it up. I apologize for uh, Dr. Wills was unable to be here tonight, so I'm kind of playing second fiddle to this group, but uh, that's okay by me. It's a it's a pleasure to be here. Can we get the lights off? So we can see that. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, 
What I'd like to do is go over uh, kind of a brief overview of, of what's happening in, in Yavapai College pertaining to uh, the district governing board, uh, their ends or goals, and then I'd like to open it up for questions. Uh, because this is a Cottonwood uh, Council meeting, you may have some specific questions pertaining to the Verde Valley campus and what we're doing here in the Verde Valley, and I'd be more than happy to, to answer those. Currently, we are going through the process of strategic planning for the entire institution. And one of the things that came out of that is a new vision statement for the college. Yavapai College makes our community a premier place to learn, work, and live. And really, those three words embody uh, the board ends and what we're trying to do from a number of standpoints for our communities. Goal one or board end one really pertains to education. Uh, there are a number of different facets that we deliver education to our communities. One is adult basic education. The second is dual credit. Is everybody here familiar with dual credit? Essentially in dual credit, what we do is we credential a high school instructor to teach college curriculum at the high school level, thereby giving high school students college credit, so straight transcripted credit. And what that allows a student to do is move through a possible pathway or program much sooner and in essence not accumulate as much, as much debt when they finish that certificate or pathway and then even if they decide to go on to a baccalaureate degree. The third one is developmental education. This one is extremely important. 75% of our population, our student population for Yavapai College, so this is across the county, is part-time. Many of those part-timers graduated 20 years ago or haven't been in school since they graduated from high school. Those developmental education courses are what we call the 089s or the 0900 classes, which really bridge that gap between students that haven't been in school for a long period of time to help them get up to speed to take those classes that actually count towards a degree or certificate. Next is transfer. Almost all of our gen ed credits at the community college level transfer to a four-year university. So we've got reciprocity there. One of the things we strive to do is make sure that a student, if they don't have to, is not taking a class that is not going to transfer to a baccalaureate degree. We do a disservice to the students if we don't have that articulation. So transfer is a very large component of what we do at Yellow Pie College. The next one is career and technical education preparing students for the workforce. And again, when we look at uh, dual credit or uh, dual enrollment, we look at working uh, as well as we can with the JTEDS, Valley Academy, Mountain Institute to offer dual credit in those career and tech ed areas as well so that students have workplace ready skills and if they decide to, can go straight into the industry once they graduate. And the last one is continuing education. We have a, a heavy retirement population in Yavapai County. It is double the national average. That's significant. That number, because it's such a, such a beautiful place to, to live, to work, to retire in, we can expect that we're going to continue to see that demographic um, increase. Therefore, it's important that we look at some of the other facets we've got when we talk about continuing education in uh, uh, general interest type courses or even if we're looking at customized training for some businesses to help train their employees up. The next one is economic development. Uh, about three years ago uh, as part of Dr. Will's plan we formed the Regional Economic Development Center and really the, 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 the goal or the focus of this is really to look at how can we help our communities in driving the economy, in developing economic development. We do that through customized training, through economic impact and policy analysis. So on, on multiple occasions, we've been asked, can you, can you provide an impact study on this particular industry? Um, we also, within the college, use that, the, the REDC, in order to run data for us. When we look at launching new programs, we want to find out the job market in Yavapai County. We want to find out, knowing that we export some students to other counties and even out of state, what is 
the job market within a regional setting because we have to provide that data to the federal government. The other one is small business development center and helping people uh, do startups to create their own businesses. You know, one of the big, the big terms out there right now is entrepreneurship. So as we look at all of our different program areas is looking how can we integrate a piece of entrepreneurship or business sense because many of our students may not want to work for somebody else. They may want to figure out how to start their own businesses, and that's important. On the academic side, uh, when we look at ec economic development again, we're really looking at career and technical education. And the old term for that used to be vocational, back in the 60s and 70s. Now that's kind of a dirty word, okay, blue collar jobs. But really looking at what types of programs uh, should we offer, should we provide opportunities for students to get employed. And again, you know, what we're hoping to look for is wage paying jobs. That they're not dead end jobs that uh, they're not gonna be able to move up the ladder, but those jobs that they can feed their families um, and provide long term uh, viability for the household. The third one is cultural enrichment. From the classes standpoint, we've got over 2,000 face-to-face -face classes, over 250 online. And since 2000, around 2002, 2005 is really when Yellow Pie College started to get in the game of online education. And really most of the research says if you're not in the game already, you're way behind. It's something that we've adapted to. And within that goes also the, the hybrid or the blended model where some of your didactic or the lecture is actually online and then you come into campus or site to do the hands-on. Another one is Osher Lifelong Learning and Ed Adventures. Uh, I think uh, Terrence mentioned it, that we've got an art gallery on each campus. And the college has two main campuses, the Prescott campus and the Verde Valley campus. The other, the other sites we have are actually sites. They don't provide full service uh, to uh, two students, okay, as far as how, um, it, how a campus is actually defined. Libraries, 20% of our county, we're 20% of our county system with our libraries. Okay, and again, providing another resource for students to come in to work on homework, to take classes. But remember, it's also open to the public. So you don't have to be a Yavapai College student in order to utilize some of these resources. And the last one, community events. Live community events, movies and satellite uh, events. And every year we put on at least one academic uh, symposium. And last year it was the World War II. The World War II, World War I. World War I symposium here on the Verde Valley campus where we had a number of guest speakers come in um, to talk about uh, some of the issues uh, pertaining to World War I. These are some of the strategic initiatives that were developed uh, for the institution as part of the process. So under student success, increase student completion rates without sacrificing academic quality. A lot of what community colleges and even universities have been, have been focused on is enrollment. And enrollment is important when you look at that portion as part of the funding formula for how community colleges generate um, their funding. More importantly, however, is completion. Are we moving students through in a timely manner? The average time to completion for a community college student nationwide is six years for a two-year degree. Six years for a two-year degree. I want you to think about that for a moment. To some extent, it makes sense because, especially here at Yavapai, like I mentioned before, 75% of our students are part-time. So they're mothers that are working, that have kids at home. They're fathers that are working jobs, that are taking care of their families, trying to go back to school as well. What we want to try to do is make sure that we've got pathways in a seamless transition to identify what those barriers are that we have control over, and what can we remove so that students can get their degree in a timely manner, and that it doesn't take them six years. Second one is economic responsiveness. Create job placement process. Another thing that the federal government is looking at community colleges and how they give community colleges a scorecard, you've seen it with high schools already, they're moving towards something like that. We're gonna be measured on completion rates, okay, and our funding could directly be tied to that through federal financial aid or Pell Grants. The second one is job placement. 
We're very good at giving skills or teaching skills to students to get them in the workplace. What becomes extremely difficult is we can't guarantee job placement afterwards. But the community college still has to do their due diligence in trying to figure out how do we match potential or uh, graduates with, with potential employers. So one of the uh, initiatives we have is to start looking at, uh, for instance, career coaches. So when you graduate from a program, we've already got somebody in place that is familiar with all of the local businesses to try to pair that student with an employer, okay? Again, trying to bone up on those uh, job placement processes. Improve district-wide awareness of YC education and training opportunities. One of the things that's come out in both of the strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis is we've got to do a better job of awareness in marketing and potential recruitment of students to let not only students but the community know what types of programs does Yavapai College offer and how can we help you reach your educational attainment? The last one, to document and share our economic impact and value to the communities that we serve. Initiative three, community engagement, increase credit and non-credit enrollment. So we wanna set a goal. If you look at nationwide trends right now, community college enrollments are dropping, okay? There's an inverse relationship when the economy goes down you see enrollments in higher education go up. What happens is when the economy improves and the economy improves, less people go back to school. They stay in their current job, they don't necessarily retool. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be looking at that as a goal. Because what that potentially does is it means we can create more opportunities for our students, both in the credit and the non-credit, which again lends largely to that population of retirement here in uh, Yapai County. One of the other things is improve uh, East County satisfaction with cultural programming, the types of things that we offer from a cultural and social aspect. And also to improve community engagement. Initiative four, organizational development, improve employee engagement and satisfaction. So not only within the community, but are we doing things that lead to a satisfying workplace internally within the college? Another aspect of that is how do we grow our own within, okay? The college doesn't do succession planning, but as we, as we talk with, with our direct reports, with our, our peers throughout the college, is if somebody's interested in retooling or moving up in the career ladder, what types of programs do we have to allow them to do that? The last one, fiscal stewardship. Model fiscal stewardship throughout the district, okay? Evaluate and revise the capital improvement plan. And a lot of that is driven by not only, for instance, all of the, uh, the buildings for Yavapai College, both East and West County, have a 90% uh, FCI rate. It means our buildings are kept very, very well. Okay, we, we invest in that. Because what you find is if you wait five years, you end up spending the same amount of money you would to bring that building back up to standard. So we might as well invest it as we go so that we've got great facilities that create an educational environment for our students. The last slide up here is just kind of a cost analysis. Um, Yavapai College is a fantastic, a fantastic bargain. We are approximately middle of the pack in, uh, in the state of Arizona for our tuition. Uh, we do not have fees associated with additional uh, cost of classes. We roll that into our, our fee structure, our tuition structure. The only programs you'll see that may have a fee are those that are market-based programs. Aviation, gunsmithing, uh, nursing is one of those. There's such a high demand for nursing right now. Um, but we try to keep, we try to keep our, our cost of tuition as low as we can. For general education, that's around $96 a credit hour. Right. So you can see by the slide up here, uh, significant savings to a student should they decide to come to a community college first rather than go to a four-year university. And I was kind of one of those uh, students. I grew up in Mayer, so I came from a small town and had a graduating class at 24. And uh, 
I found that right out of high school when I went to Yavapai Community College, it, w it was a good transition because when I went in the military and got out, went down to the University of Arizona, you're in a lecture hall with 500 students and you're just another number. So again, we, you know, we, we try to provide the, the services as best we can. Uh, we know that there's always room for improvement. And you're going to hear by uh, the Verde Valley uh, uh, Board Advisory Committee uh, after I get done here on some of the recommendations they have. And what we've tried to do is, is, is listen to our communities to get input about how we can get better at what we do. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions. Any questions, council members? I, guess, Mr. I, Dunley? I just had one through there. You had said that the, the national average for completion of a two year set was six years? Six years. <clears throat> what is Yavapai County or what is Yavapai College is at right now? Do we we're know? about, we're right there with the right national average. average. Correct, correct. Some of our students move through in, in, in a much faster, timely <coughs> manner. We find that um, if you're a full time student, you'll normally move through in two years. But because predominantly we are a part-time student, uh, that demographic takes a lot longer because what happens is life takes place. Mr. Elinsky? So what are some of the barriers that you're looking at removing to increase the, uh, you know, the rate of graduation? One of the, some of the things that we're looking at, and I want to make a note that uh, what I just showed you as far as the strategic initiatives are for the whole institution. Um, this year, we've been working on a strategic plan for the Verde Valley as well, specific to the Verde Valley and some of the issues that we face. Um, one of the issues that I think we need to address over here uh, in the East Valley is we've really got to look at tightening up our schedule, how we're scheduling classes. All right. What I found uh, over the last couple of years is in many cases, we're cannibalizing enrollment, meaning that, I'll give an example, we have a sociology class in a psychology class that are running at the same time frame. Well, both those classes count towards the same block of credits within a transfer degree. We shouldn't be doing that, okay? The other thing we need to look at is when a student comes to campus, we need a schedule that they, they can take multiple classes without taking an English 101 class, and then their next class isn't for another three hours. We need to try to keep them on campus, if at all possible. Um, another thing that we're, we're looking at is a lot of the for-profit privates do an intensive cohort seven-week class. So instead of taking 12 to 15 hours where you're taking five classes, you concentrate on one class over a seven-week period. All right, and you try to move students through as a cohort model. We found that that, that works extremely well. The other thing uh, we're doing is working with our learning center for supplemental instruction. Instruction shouldn't just end once the class ends. We should be utilizing our tutoring center. We should be utilizing our faculty in the, in the learning center to tutor those students. They're the best ones to be doing the tutoring. So again, we want to try to look at some of those best practices that work and try to let students know of all the resources we have so that we can help them better. I have one other question. Okay, yes, please. The third initiative uh, is to increase East County satisfaction on cultural programming. Can you go into a little more detail on that? Sure. Um, it, one of the things that's been brought up multiple times is if you're familiar with the Prescott campus, we have a performing arts center. Okay. Uh, the Verde Valley, uh, Yavapai College in the Verde Valley does not have that. We have a pavilion, a smaller pavilion on the Verde Valley campus. Really what we want to look at is, is gauging the community and what interests them from a social and cultural aspect and trying to bring some of those things over here, knowing that we can partner with Mingus Union, we can partner with Sedona Performing Arts Center, those sorts of things to bring maybe some of those bigger performing art acts. But again, really listening to the community on what types of things are they interested in that can provide that social and cultural enrichment. Questions? So will you be staying then for the next presentation and be available for questions? Or? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you for being here tonight. We appreciate that update. Okay. So the next item is um, an update on the progress of the Yavapai College Governing Board Advisory Committee by Council Member Garrison, City Representative to the Committee.
And we have the President, Paul Chavalet, and I probably didn't do that very well. <laughs> and Bill Regner. And Good any? evening, Mayor and Council. Good Thank evening. Thank you for taking the time to allow me to give, or allow us to give a little more in-depth version or uh, response to what we're doing uh, with the committee. Uh, our history is uh, that we, we were formed out of the brainchild of Al Filardo and Harold Harrington. Harold Harrington was a past board member. He was still serving when Al came on. They came up with the idea of creating a, uh, a group on this side of the uh, mountain to help figure out how to create a stronger bond with the communities and the college. So uh, they came out, went to the different municipalities. We were one of which put out some recommendations. The uh, pool was formed. Tim Carter from the uh, Yepai County Board of Air, the, he's a superintendent of education, did the interviews, picked a committee out of that group, and, and we were formed, and that was about nine months ago. Um, since then, we kind of determined how we were going to do business and uh, our goals, and our goals are really th three. One was to educate ourselves on what the college is doing and how it's doing it. The other was to go out and advocate to the communities what the college is doing and learn from the communities what they would like to see their college doing that it possibly isn't currently. And then our final goal will be, and we haven't gotten there yet, we're at the second stage right now, is to report back to the board and advise the board on what we believe the communities are saying they would like. I want to reiterate that we're not the board. We don't work for the college. We are an advisory committee to the board directly. We don't advise the uh, administration of the college. Um, one more thing I wanted to share is we have Mr. Mayberry in the back. He's on, on Dean Perry or Dr. Perry's committee. They, they, they have a little different uh, goal than we do. They're looking at the college and at the campuses in the Verde Valley specifically on programs and offerings and, and the facilities. We're kind of doing a more uh, 30,000 foot, I guess, a view of what's happening and, and asking the communities what they need. But to that point, it's taken us about nine months of uh, very uh, long, intensive uh, discussions with the different uh, deans and, and uh, administrators of the college. And the college has been extremely uh, supportive in bringing those people to us so we can sit down and have these discussions about where we're going. Matter of fact, one of those was uh, Clint Ewell came in and he's actually presented to us twice. He's the money man. And uh, it, it, it's a lot to take your head in or get your head around. There's, there's a lot going on. We have, uh, it's an amazing institution. Uh, we have a ton of opportunities out there. We've got some great facilities in the Verde Valley and in Prescott. And it, it just, it's taken us a while to figure out how to maybe utilize those facilities and the programs that are being offered in order to do more to create satisfaction within the community. So that's where we're at. That's where we've gone. And so what I'll be presenting to you, and you all have a copy of it in front of you, is the this is a summary of the recommendation report we gave back to the governing board in uh, June of this year. And we're just going to go down the list and explain the 16 items that we recommended to the board. And what I would hope to do is if you could save your questions till we get to the end because what you may want to ask about we may cover a little further down these are kind of we tried to condense it as much as possible for uh, make it easy and not overwhelming but some of these are going to take obviously a little more uh, explaining to get to the root of what we we're after so therefore we're going to kind of tag team and and as you as you mentioned earlier, this is Paul Chevalier, he's our board <coughs> chair, and this is Bill Regner, he's our vice chair. And so we're going to just kind of go down through these, and we all have different ones that we were a little more involved in getting on this list, so we're going to attack those as they come down the list. Bill? You get to sit. Randy? Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor, Council Members, City Manager. Uh, I am Bill Regner. I'm a resident of Clarkdale. I'm the Vice Chairman of the Verde Valley Board Advisory Committee. The first recommendation that, that I've uh, been asked to talk to you about is uh, was to allocate a fair greater percentage of financial resources generated in the Verde Valley to the Verde Valley. 
And so this is a question I think that a lot of people have had for a, a long time that we've been seeking answers to. Uh, we know, uh, we think we had an idea how much money was being generated in, in revenues from uh, property taxes, primary and secondary property taxes, but not sure about the expenses. Uh, we learned that the college does not track their expenses by location. And so it was difficult for them to create uh, uh, accurate uh, ex revenue and expense uh, sheets. And so uh, after some discussion, they agreed to uh, look at creating some assumptions about what the, their expenses are for the campuses in the Verde Valley, meaning the one in Clarkdale and the one in, in Sedona. And so Dr. Clint Ewell, who is the Vice President of Finance and Administration, uh, provided that information and met with us on October 7th at our meeting. And you, I believe you have been provided a spreadsheet that is part of the packet that he presented to us. And the rest of it was a justification for the assumptions that, that they came up with. And, but the spreadsheet kind of uh, paints the picture of the, of, the, of the last five years and uh, what their expenses are, what the revenues are and expenses are. And it shows that the Verde Valley campuses have received back about 87% of the revenues that were generated through uh, primary property taxes, tuition, fees, state shared revenues, things like that. And so that, you know, looks actually like, you know, it might be a pretty reasonable share to receive back. Uh, what we did then is in asked questions in that meeting was uh, whether this was a typical five-year period. Because I think we all know that there's been a lot of construction over the last five years uh, at, in the Clarkdale campus. There has been some, some uh, construction and some acquisition happening in the Sedona campus. And so was this a typical five-year period? And could we say that 87%, even though that seems like a, a reasonable number uh, to strive for, what, actually, has that actually been what's happened over the past five years? And so we, we took the numbers that they provided, the assumptions that they provided, and we t uh, created our own assumptions about uh, how to back out those capital expenses of the past five years to determine what the revenues versus expenses of operation might be, and then tried to make some assumptions about, okay, what, uh, what might be a reasonable amount of money to, that would, might uh, in, in any typical year be applied towards capital construction. And in doing so, what we, what we determined is that um, over the last, well, from the spreadsheet you can see, over the last five years, that there's been about $72 million in revenue and about $62.6 .6 million in expenses, which left $9.3 million in excess over that five-year period. So that, that excess meeting money that was not spent in the Verde Valley, and it, we assume spent in some other part of, of the campus, of the, of the college. And that averaged out to about $1.9 million a year. Is this typical? Probably, maybe not. Um, about $26.3 million was spent on the Verde Valley campuses uh, for in capital improvements over the course of the five years that you're seeing there. Um, about uh, $25 million, 25.2 here in the Verde Valley campus, 1.1 in the Sedona campus. So when you back these things, this, this kind of money out uh, from, from the revenues, it looks like there's somewhere between 5.5 to $7.1 million annually in excess revenues that is not spent in the Verde Valley. And so the question becomes, uh, is, is that uh, something that is acceptable to us? The, over the five years that in the spreadsheet you have, the about $26.3 million was spent on capital expenses in the Verde Valley campuses and in excess revenues using a very conservative $5.5 million a year, we generated $27.5 million. So we more than paid for the, the capital expenses that happened in the five-year picture that you're seeing there. And then we have to look at, okay, what happened prior to that and what happened what happens after that? When you look prior to that, you look at the 2000, we don't have the data uh, for each year, but if you look at the, go back to the 2000 uh, uh, general obligation bond issue, which was uh, $69.5 million, voted by the entire county, uh, for Yavapai County, um, 
we, we've, the, our best assumptions, we figured that the Verde Valley, the debt service provided by the Verde Valley in your secondary property taxes is between 1.6 and $2 million a year annually. And so using again a conservative number, 1.6 million times the 15 years since that, that bond issue, 2000 to 2015, we've generated about $24 million in um, debt service. And we received back from that government, that general obligation bond, $9.6 million in capital expenses on the Verde Valley campus building, uh, building M, where the art gallery is, library is, the, the large meeting room. You have building L, which became the, started as a technical center, became, I believe, the nursing uh, program. And so that, looking back, it doesn't appear that we were receiving well, it appears that this is what we were receiving back. Looking forward to the 10-year plan that was adopted recently, um, initially came out at $104 million. The Verde Valley was scheduled to get $3.5 million of that $104 million. It's now grown to somewhere between $111 and $118 million, and the Verde Valley will, is scheduled to receive $6 million. $3 million in Sedona, $3 million in the at the Clarkdale campus. Okay, so in the 10-year plan, if, if, if conservatively, again, if we are contributing in excess $5.5 .5 million a year, that's $55 million over the course of the 10 years. That is roughly half of the entire 10-year plan budget for which we are receiving $6 million. $55 million receiving $6 million. And of course, this does not; these figures do not do not include the previous years of, of excess revenue that we, because we don't have that data. So the prompts, the questions, I believe, for for us, and that we would you know look, we would seek your your uh, feedback on is uh, you know what kind of programs and salaries and equipment and buildings could we do in the Verde Valley with a minimum of 5.5 .5 million dollars a year maybe as much as $7.3 million. Um, and no, what could we do? What could we envision you know, when we look at what's possible here? And, uh, and then what percentages are we content with? You know, certainly some of our students go over to the western side of the, the county and can take advantage of the programs and classes there that live in the dorms or, or travel back and forth. They have the resources, ability to do that. But we believe that's a, probably a pretty small percentage of the students in the Verde Valley. But, but certainly we, we, we um, can justify spending money to, set, to support the programs and capital expenses and things like that on, in that part of the county because some of our students take advantage of it. But what's that number? Excuse me, what is that number? What's that percentage? And that's, that's the question that we're asking in this first one. And this will be the longest of my explanations of any of these, I assure you. So thank you very much. Any questions on that? Questions? Okay. Otherwise, yes. questions? They want to take questions later. Good evening. That's right. Um, Paul Chevalier. I'm saying that for Diane because she really wants to know how to pronounce my name. <laughs> um, it's complicated what we're trying to talk about tonight. We just think that you know you, you play a key role on what we're doing going forward. We're trying to do positive things for the college, which means you're doing positive things for the communities and bring them all together in synergy. So the second recommendation we have here is establish effective and efficient local decision making through a Verde advocate structure rather than through Prescott. Now this is not meant to be critical of Prescott. This is meant to come up with a better idea. If you think about how things work now, just about everybody that's in a position of authority in the college lives in or near Prescott. Consciously and unconsciously, they become advocates for their city. They know the people in the city. They know the issues in the city. They know what would people want to have, and they balance that in making decisions, and they become concentrated and conscious on the place that they live. And they've done a wonderful job. I mean, I go to the Prescott's campus and I think, God, this is probably the nicest community college campus I've ever seen in my life. And I mean that in a very positive way. But we haven't had that in the Verde. 
So when it comes to making decision making in Prescott, I'm surmising it goes like this. Oh, let's put together a 10 year plan. Well, look, we know all these great things are needed in Prescott or, or Prescott Valley. So they come up with $101 million worth of stuff. But we don't have any advocate from the Verde Valley saying, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, those guys pay 30% of the taxes that are going to pay for this. Wait a minute, wait a minute, look at all these things over here you ought to put in. We don't have anybody that's standing up there and saying, got to put us in as part of this too. That's a problem, and it's a problem for the college because it always comes back. At some point, a lot of citizens get frustrated that their tax money isn't being used over here. So if you have an advocate structure, which means some very senior person in the organization here who can be part of those discussions and say, wait a minute, we need this kind of education over here. We need to do these local things. Some of the things Dean Perry was talking about, but also to stand up there for the capital improvements. Say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're going to pay 30% of the tax. Now, let me go back 15 years. 15 years ago, we had this bond issue that was put out for us. And what did the college present us? And I don't think any of the people who are running the college now were there then, so I think it's easier to say that. But what they did 15 years ago is they gave us a list. These are the things we're going to do in the Verde Valley. These are the things we're going to do other places. They knew how much it had to cost, obviously, because they're asking for around $70 million. So they had a plan on how much this stuff was going to cost. But they never broke it out. They never told the people of the Verde that 15% of the money was going to be spent here, but they were going to pay 30% of the tax. Now, the boat that they're in today is if they want to have another bond issue, they're not going to get the votes from the Verde Valley because people are going to come out and say, this is how they screwed you 15 years ago. So they're not going to get another bond issue. So the only way they can raise money now is either they get grants or they get the money from taxes. And the challenge is there's a whole bunch of things they want to do on the other side of the mountain. Good things. And the only way to do that is to take our tax money, more of it than we think they should. So we need an advocate to stand up there and say, well, that's all great, but you're going to have to come up with another plan because we need this, this, and this, and this in these different communities. That's why we're saying you've got to have an advocate. Let me go on to the next item, which is uh, implement an ongoing Verde marketing and recruitment program of continuous and direct interaction with Verde lower and secondary education students and their parents. What we had in our heads was a program where there is probably a permanent person on staff who works with the counselors in the various schools, particularly the high schools, comes up with a plan to start getting to know these kids from the time they enter high school, and also do some work with the people in the lower school. You know, maybe once a year they do something for the lower school. But figure out, student by student, over time, they got four years to do this. The student's there for four years in high school, I hope. Uh, and, and to figure out what is that person good at and what do they want to do. And then that's good for two things. One, you can start telling the people how Verde could help them. It's not going to help all of them, but how Verde could help the, 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 the Verde Valley uh, Yavapai College could help them. The second thing is it's going to do is we're going to learn from them stuff that they're interested in that maybe we're not teaching. Maybe we start trying to teach it. It's a real plus. Now, the second part of that is the parents. You've got to get to know the parents of these kids. You've got to find ways to get to know the parents. You can work with the high schools and get yourself involved in some of the parent things that are going on. You don't have to come up with brand new programs. But this is an integrated program that goes on and on and on and on and has somebody that's in charge of it. Last week, I went to Red Rock High School because I wanted to see if I could get some of the high school students to come over and speak at the town hall that we're going to have tomorrow. I, I got a class of, of juniors with one senior in it, but the rest were juniors in government. Pretty impressive class of kids, I must say. 24 of them. And I said, okay, I want to talk about Yalapai College. I said, first of all, how many of you are going to college? Just about everybody in the class. How many of you are going to Yalapai College? Nobody. What do you guys know about Yalapai College? Nothing. No answers. I'm start, so I start pulling answers out of them. Well, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? And I start telling them a little bit about how Yavapai could help them. And you know, one question I asked them, which was interesting though, is do you guys want to go away to college just to get away? Half the class, see? 
they're going to go away because they want to get away, but maybe they'll go over to Prescott. But the other half didn't know about it. There's no connection. This is Red Rock High School. And I think I had a pretty good class of kids. And we'll see if they show up. So I said, how many would want to come over and talk tomorrow? Nobody. Teacher said, what if I give you extra credit? <laughs> Six hands went up. <laughs> so that's really what it's taking to even get them to come over. And, because we want to get clues from them as what are the kinds of things they'd like to see the college teach or do. And so maybe we'll have some of them come over. So that's why we have that recommendation. The next recommendation, the final one I'm going to talk to at this moment, is focus on increasing student numbers in the Verde. Executive Dean Perry, in different words, basically said the same thing. But let me tell you how bad it's gotten. And I'm going to talk percentage, not numbers, because the numbers have gone down on both sides of the mountain. 2004, this is from the Yavapai College Annual Report. 33% of the students of Yavapai College were in the Verde Valley. 2014, 14%. That's a problem. I can't tell you all the reasons for the problems, but this should be an end in itself. All the things we're talking about, and we'll be talking about, and things the dean are doing, will help increase those numbers. But that ought to be right up there as a top goal. Increase the numbers, increase the numbers. And then you have all these different means to do it. Thank you. Kind of what, what he was, what we found going out into the communities is, is we have we have really great facilities and great programs happening right here in the Verde Valley and in Prescott when it comes to the by College, but there seems to be a disconnect when it comes to getting back into the schools and allowing, setting those expectations from our students on what they can achieve here without having to leave. So, so that that's where they come from. We're trying to figure out how to make the students, high school students, more aware of what's available to them here locally, as well as raise that level of expectations of what can actually be achieved right here without having to leave home and go elsewhere. Uh, the next item on the list is uh, coming in, ha having all these different deans come in and talk to us. Uh, CTE or career and technology education was kind of one of the low fruits that was identified right off the bat. Um, if you haven't been over to the SeaTac building in Prescott Valley or Prescott, I guess it's at the airport, uh, they're actually going to be holding a uh, workforce uh, open house, I believe, next week. And uh, they're going to give tours of the campus. If you haven't seen the facility, it's absolutely amazing. It's world class. It really is. And, and that's not a joke. They teach a gun class, a gunsmithing class there that people come here from all over the world to sign up for and take. They have a uh, diesel mechanic. They have linemen now. They have uh, CAD. They have uh, the different uh, milling machines. It's, it's amazing what is in that facility and what's available. Unfortunately, it's on the other side of the hill, which makes it somewhat unrealistic for the students over here to access it on a daily or a weekly basis. Uh, so what was identified by the groups is somehow we need to create a better partnership working with the schools and, the, and VAC, which is our local career and technology uh, district that overlaps the high schools, and see if there isn't a better way to create some of those career technology programs over here. Uh, Dr. Perry and I spent most of the day today at the VAct offices. They had a special meeting, brought in all the superintendents and the business managers from the local school districts to discuss just how maybe the whole model of career and technology education is changing and how they need to stay up with the high schools and, and possibly get the college to partner on creating this, this model that, that allows not only the schools to in, enhance and expand what they offer but also the community to take advantage of that as well because we have a very much older crowd here and a lot of people need those job skills in order to either advance in their jobs or to get new jobs so we want to make sure whatever happens is is capable of being used by the entire communities not just little pockets of people in that community the next is uh, prioritize a building a state-of-the-art delivery system and I'm gonna piggyback that on with add sufficient remote learning centers for distance learning opportunities. One of the things that Dr. Perry uh, mentioned in his presentation was uh, the face of education has changed. Online education is becoming a reality, not, not an exception. And one of the, the 
items that has stood out in all of our presentations and, and every time we go in the communities and talk to the communities is access to education. We got to figure out a better way to get people to the education rather than having to get in a car and drive to it. So one of the items or the ideas we came up with is somehow creating learning centers and, and possibly partnering up with the different uh, high schools or school districts, because we can even do this on K-8, K and utilize their technology, the, uh, the nation wants to have and is actually implementing a uh, technology uh, learning center on the, on the uh, Middle Verde Reservation at the moment also. But we're trying to figure out how we can tie all those together so we don't necessarily have to have people drive over to Prescott or or drive over here to teach or learn a class. We can figure out a way to uh, let people go right into their community, sit in the room, get that experience, get that knowledge from a teacher without actually having to leave their community to do it. And so that's that's what that's about, is trying to provide better access. You have two more. <coughs> those are yours, okay. I'd like to step back just a little bit to the, uh, the concept of recruitment. What we have learned over and over again is that the, they start programs in the Verde Valley and they get a, a cohort of uh, students coming in for the first few years and then those tailor, taper off and then they don't have enough students to, to continue them. And so what's very clear to us is that, that not only is recruitment necessary in the Verde Valley, as was described, but we, we have to design programs and fund programs and make the initial capital investment in programs to make them attractive to people to come from outside of the Verde Valley, much like our viticulture and enology program. So we, any program that we do has to be able to attract people from outside of the area and in order to sustain itself. So sustainability is an important aspect of this. We can't just keep starting programs, having them go for a couple of years and then wither away. We've got to get the local students involved in it. We've got to bring students in from outside. And, it, and you, in, in order to do that, not only marketing, you have to create a program that, peop, that attracts those people to come in to it. So it's a very important aspect of that. When we talked about, Randy kind of talked about uh, the uh, prioritize uh, building a state-of-the-art delivery system. We, when we, and it's kind of gone in conjunction with another thing I'm going to talk about, which is broadband. When we first started this work, we were kind of given the message that well, the, the, for the Verde Valley, your future is e-learning, distance learning. And we kind of went, hmm, you know, well, if the future of education, you know, what we're reading and re our research is telling us is that e-learning and distance learning is the future of education, you know, across the board. And every major university in the country has those programs. Now, you can go online and get your four-year degree or more from from ASU, from you know Harvard, from you know any number of, of, of major institutions. So that's if that's the future, then let's embrace this countywide. Let's not just make this a Verde Valley thing. Let's let's say for all of Yavapai County, let's let's uh, let's invest in the infrastructure to to make that happen, and the, the delivery systems to allow that to happen. Let's make sure we're state of the art in order to do that. Um, We, we talked about in, in we talked about um, providing number eight is provide an increased core transfer courses number nine is provide an increased multiple pathways two plus one two plus two certification and CTD this is not a statement that this we're not trying to say here that this is not happening now we're saying this is a value we want to make sure that every student in the Verde Valley who wants to get their core courses taken care of in order to transfer to a, another university another school can get those here in the Verde Valley. That they don't have to get do some of them here, some of them in Prescott. They can get it all here and then they can decide what they're going to do next. They can transfer to NAU, U of A, ASU, or, or anywhere else outside of the state. So that, that's important. We also want to have two, what's called two plus one uh, courses. That means you, the two is you get your core courses done and then in conjunction with one of the state universities, often it's going to be NAU here, you can get, um, without leaving the Verde Valley, you can take courses through that university and get your whatever it is. Like there's a, a Bachelor of Nursing Science, I believe, which is a two plus one course, which means you take your core courses here, and then you take that third year 
in conjunction with NAU here in the Verde Valley, and you come out of it with your, your BSA and your Bachelor of Nursing Science. Same thing in the two plus two. You, you, you do your two years of coursework here, and you get your two years of, of upper, upper divisions through another you know, partnership with a, a major university, and you come out with a degree from that university without ever having to leave the Verde Valley. That's what we want here. Um, I'm just going to, you want me to just, uh, yeah, go ahead. So, um, <coughs> I got 10. That, that comes to item 11. I'm, I'm just going to skip rather than go down. Uh, add focus on working with governments in all of communities to increase broadband coverage that can be used by the college. Broad, you know, maybe it's bandwidth is a better description. We need the, the amount of bandwidth necessary in the Verde Valley, to, you know, to have these kind of distance learning programs, to have these remote satellite centers. And, and this, is, uh, this is only a request to the Yavapai College that they become an active, a proactive partner in working with other groups and municipalities or whoever to bring that bandwidth to the Verde Valley. Number 12, it was, uh, Chairman uh, Shawai mentioned this, but fund all capital projects privately or through bonding rather than taxes, tuitions, and fees. What we think we're noticing, what we think we have discovered is that, as Chairman Shoye mentioned, floating bond issues in Navapai County is not, is not an easy thing. And the west side of the county has historically not been as supportive of those kinds of issue, bond issues as, as we have been in the Verde Valley. And so there's a, there may be, we suspect a hesitancy to try to, to pay for these capital improvements through bonding measures. So, what's the solution? Let's take money that we're gathering through primary property tax dollars, tuition, fees, and other, and let's use that money to build our capital projects rather than go out to the voters for it. Our, our suggestion is that, you know, you, you know you have the support of the voters for the kind of projects that you're wanting to do if they're willing to vote for them and pass those bonds. And so we encourage that, that those kind of large capital projects be funded through bonding measures and that the, the, pro the primary property tax re revenues, tuition and fees and uh, state share revenues, things like that, are used for mostly for programs and salaries, equipment and, and things like that that, uh, that make these programs state of the art and make them the kind of programs that people are go here are going to want to go through, and people are going to want to come here to go through. Thank you. Just another word on uh, bonding issues. Of course, the dilemma for the college is this. They try to do a bond issue today. It's unlikely they would get it through for anything. But in the future, that should change. But one good thing about going to the voters for capital improvements is you ask yourself, wait a minute, is this something that the community will support? Would they support tennis courts? Maybe not. So maybe we shouldn't put that on the list. And that's the kind of issue you ask yourself. But the only things that you should do capital improvements on are the things that the public thinks are, are valid for their money to be spent on. And so, but if you said, well, we want to have more core cl classes, well, you know, okay, public's going to listen to that. You explain why you need more money for more classes and more classroom buildings, they're going to listen to that. So that's a valuable thing about going to the voters. I found in my life that, you know, when it comes to money issues, voters are pretty savvy. They're really savvier than most, most uh, committees that do it. And uh, that's a good way to do it. I know it's going to take time before we can get there. And I recognize that until we get to the point where we do it, that more money is going to come out of our primary taxes. But we ought to look at it the same way that the voters would look at it. Would they really want to spend the money on X? And if the answer is no, well, let's not do X. And one way to find that out, of course, is to ask the communities what they want. So I want to go to number 11 now. Uh, 10. No, what, no. 10. I'm on 10. Okay. Increase Verde scholarship and financial assistance and maintain affordable tuition rate. You know, we have an affordable tuition rate, but the problem is each year it gets less affordable. Each year we add to it. And every time you increase the tuition rate, you can reasonably expect that that's going to knock some people out of getting an education. 
You know, maybe $75 is okay for most people, but maybe a few got dropped off when we go to $75. So we ought to be cautious about that. We ought to be see how we can do this. There's a lot of push right now with some of the presidential candidates to have free or almost free college education. College is new high school. I mean, when, we, when I graduated, high school was what college is now as far as a degree. If you don't have a college degree, you have a really tough time unless you have a skill. If you have a skill, you can make more money than the guys with the college degrees or the ladies with it. But uh, we have to be very careful about increasing our fees. Dual enrollment <coughs> fee is a good example. You know, there's talk about raising the dual enrollment fee, uh, creating a dual enrollment fee. That's going to be a mistake. It's going to knock some people out. And so we need to be very frugal on these fees, even though we're not charging anywhere as much as the other colleges. Our goal is to get as many people educated as, as we can. I'm going to skip the 16, and then Randy's going to take the rest of them in between. Recommend <coughs> revised criteria for evaluating investments needed for new programs, as well as criteria for continuing programs. Executive Dean Perry touched on this. One of the problems we have is we want enough people in the class to justify the expense of running the class. But this is a two-edged sword. Because if people think, well, they're probably going to class, uh, they're probably not going to continue that class, not got enough people, they don't sign up for it. They say, I'll go online and take it because they're not going to really have that class. So each year we start out with a large number of classes and you don't get enough of a sign up and it comes down to a small number of classes. So one of the ideas on this, that wasn't my idea, it came from someone at the college, but I liked it, is, okay, we're going to come up and we're going to say, pick a number. We're going to have these 70 classes over in Clarkdale. And we won't cancel them, as long as at least one person signs up. We won't cancel them. We're going to get the reputation that if we say we're going to have a class, we're going to have it. And each year, more and more people are going to say, well, they're really going to have that class, and more and more people will sign up. That's one possible approach to this. But the way we're doing now is self-defeating. Um, the next item is going to be 13, is, is further incorporate workforce demand analysis and education make decisions um, and build a stronger local partnership with business development and job creation. Where that comes from is um, <coughs> the college has created a uh, economic development center as part of their uh, goal of trying to figure out what programs to offer going into the future. Part of the problem that we're finding over here is the West Valley and the East Valley are very different in their needs and their wants, yet the decisions seem to be coming from the West Valley on what we offer in the East Valley or the East yeah. Valley uh, side of the mountain county. So we're trying to figure out, and this kind of goes right back up to uh, establish effective and, and efficient local decision making. It we need to start looking about what the needs are more directly related to the communities here versus the county as a whole, and and try and build that stronger partnership with the businesses that are here also, because that. That's a different model as well. The next is focus on solutions for very affordable student housing. We're not advocating creating student housing over here, um, but it's come up over and over that it's possibly a, a detractor from the ability to sustain some of the programs that the college has started. One example of that would be the viticulture and enology program that the college has taken on. One of the beauties of that program is, is it's a draw that brings people here from all over the state and southwest uh, U.S. So we're creating that program to pull them in here, but once they get here, we don't have any place for them to live. And as you know, housing is very expensive. So our thoughts were, and the thoughts from those that have presented to us, is, is that may be a key uh, element to actually creating a sustainable program is there's got to be some way to, to to take care of the people that are uprooting themselves coming here for two or three years to learn a trade or learn an avocation and then go back and, and use it wherever they're going. Uh, it isn't just about who lives here. Uh, the other and the last one is encouraging immediate exploration of alternative models 
or structures to increase foundation related activities and fundraising in the Verde. Uh, we actually, the college has a very robust foundation. Uh, they've raised and raised a, a tremendous amount of money and they put that back into the college in scholarships and in capital projects or helping fund capital projects. The college foundation was very instrumental in getting the wine center built here uh, and a lot of that was grassroots with the Verde Valley chapter that had been part of that group as well but that sense has been disbanded. Uh, we're looking to try and re reincorporate that model back here again and the possibility of actually having a separate foundation instead of being a partner or a chapter of the existing foundation. One of the problems that we're finding going into the communities is people want to know that the money raised here and brought in here is going to be spent here and when that's done in a group or done by a group that's servicing the entire college community there's always that level of distrust or or uncertainty about how that money is going to be put back into the school or into the facility. So one way to quickly get rid of that issue is, <coughs> is to create a separate <coughs> foundation over here that would be directly responsible to the constituents that they're asking the money from in the first place. So that basically outlines our 16 recommendations and like I said, that's been this has been an ongoing project for eight months we have two meetings a month uh, we've had a lot of presentations by a lot of deans and uh, a lot of discussion and that's a lot to uh, try and digest in a very short period of time so if you have for that just one final thing i just want to make this really clear to everybody we're now about to enter a new phase starting tomorrow we're going to start having uh, town halls in various parts of the verde to learn directly from the citizens. You know, we've been going out, as, as Randy said, and we've been talking to the leaders. We've been talking to uh, basically the leaders, and so now we're going to talk to the people who aren't necessarily leaders, but they've got a lot of strong ideas. So tomorrow we're going to learn more things, and undoubtedly more recommendations will come out of it. But we're going to do it here, we're going to do it in communities all over the Verde Valley. We have a lot more to do. We're not even close to being finished with this, and we're excited about doing it. The, uh, just, and I'll reiterate, the, the meeting tomorrow night, the town hall in Sedona, will be actually at the Verde Valley, or at the Sedona campus. Uh, there will be plenty of people on site to help direct you to the room and get you signed up if you want to come and speak and fill out a note card. And we won't be interacting with everybody that presents tomorrow, but we're pretty much just asking the community to come out, share their opinions on what they would like to see the college do or what they think they could do better, and for us to take that information back and, and try and mold it into everything that we've learned up to this point. So is there any questions? Mr. Linsky, could we put the lights on, please? Um, Mr. Linsky? I just want to thank you for your thorough explanation of everything. It answered a lot of my questions. I'm just curious, um, what did the governing board have to say about your recommendations or have they reviewed it or come back with any kind of formal anything we were we, we presented this back in June it was I think not tabled but it was decided that it would be part of a retreat okay and I don't know that you've actually had a chance to thoroughly discuss the recommendations or the board has had a chance to discuss the recommendations that were given to them and like I said, we don't. We, this wasn't a presentation to to the <coughs> president or the administration. This was strictly to the board. Board, yeah. It just seems like these are, you know, a lot of these are very practical recommendations, and some of them seem quite lofty. And I'm sure there's <coughs> major financial implications. I'm just curious what the. You know. One of the things that's been extremely nice about this whole process is Dr. Perry's been a uh, participating member in, in our meetings in the morning. He doesn't come to all of them, but he makes a lot of them. And they are listening to what the recommendations are and, and how we're getting there. And they're actually incorporating that in his group into the recommendations that they also will be bringing back to the board okay. administration. So um, one of the board members, Mr. Filardo, is here. Do you wish to address <coughs> us or the public on anything? talked about today? Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Members, yes, this is, this is an extremely good process because what it's doing 
is it's giving the college an opportunity to give you basically a state of the union every year and the Verde Valley Board Advisory Committee allows the community to give a voice to almost the total community, uh, municipalities in the Verde Valley to express their opinions, uh, as you have heard. But here is what's happening. The district governing board basically have ends. They have three ends, and Dr. Perry has shown three ends to you all tonight. Ends are statement of expected results. So what happens with that is the college leadership takes the statement of expected results and they look at that and they will say, we will give this a reasonable interpretation. And those reasonable interpretation will be located in a thing called the strategic plan. So until the strategic plan is complete, it's pretty hard to take a look at whether the recommendation is being implemented totally. But I can tell you that some of the things that the Verde Valley Board Advisory Committee has already found low-hanging fruit has already been implemented. When the, super, when the superintendents came to us and said, our kids don't know anything about Yavapai College, they have begun a tour for the elementary school students. So a whole lot of things are happening because of this action. But formally, until the district, uh, until the strategic plan is complete, you really won't be able to connect the dots regarding whether some of the recommendations will be taken or not. Some obviously have not been taken. I don't know if you've noticed, but if you look, you're paying more taxes to Yabapai College than you are to Yabapai County. I don't know if you've noticed that. So their recommendation not to increase taxes well, obviously was not taken. But there are a whole lot of other things that the college leadership have already taken action on. But the rest of it, until we see the strategic plan, which is something I have pushed for for a long, long time, until that is complete, we really won't be able to connect the dots. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So will there be anybody from the Verde Valley uh, or anybody from this uh, committee that will have a voice during this strategic planning sessions? Well, a whole lot. Dean Perry is doing the portion of the strategic plan from the Verde Valley as to be incorporated in the main strategic plan. And he has come to the meeting of these gentlemen, the Verde Valley Board Advisory Committee, and he has given that feedback to the strategic planning group. Okay. okay. Thank you. Anything, any questions, council members? For Mr. Filardo, thank you very much for being here. Um, okay. Go ahead. Like, like I started out, the, you know, we have, we had three goals. One was to educate ourselves on what the college is doing, how it's doing its business, mm -hmm. and, and how it finances what it does in particular the Verde Valley. The, the next is, is advocacy. We've been going out in the communities having meetings with the different councils. Now we're starting to have our public forums. Uh, we'll have the one tomorrow in Sedona. Hopefully, November we'll be having one here, but with the holidays, that may get pushed back. Um, we've been trying to keep everything on a very tight, uh, very fast-moving schedule so we don't end up with a lot of wasted time and, and uh, lag. So uh, we're gonna try and push to get that here in November. We'll be inviting the, basically the whole Upper Verde Valley will be asked to participate in that one because it'll be a little harder to get into towns like Clarkdale or Jerome. Uh, so we'll have that opportunity to go out and, and hear back from the public. Part of what we've been doing though also is, is there's a lot of misperceptions about what's happening out there in regards to the college and how it's doing its business and we've been able to, through all the pres presentations we've had so far, been able to help squash some of those rumors or, or redirect some of that that energy into things that are more positive and you know that once again to reiterate the college is a great facility um, it's a great institution it's a great opportunity we're just trying to figure out how to make it blend in with the Verde Valley a little more uh, appropriately so I have a question on the 16 items <coughs> like the one that and I've heard this before it's <coughs> like um, adding a dorm 
And so, like, the items that would cost more money, have you come up with a plan or an idea of how to pay for those? Well, that was covered in number one. There, we believe there's, um, and that the whole reason for number one being uh, a very drawn out explanation, and, and I, uh, I don't think you have the spreadsheet that, that Mr. Regner was talking about. Mm -hmm. I'll make sure you get that. Uh, but I did include the uh, letter the editor of the My Turn that was posted in the Verde, Inde Verde Independent. Uh, and that goes through and gives a little better breakdown of what's happening. We believe that the college does have the resources available to Current, do things here in the Verde Valley that up till now have been possibly redirected other places that didn't necessarily sustain or support the programs here. So we believe there is the funding available to do these things and do it here on the campus. The, the problem comes in trying to learn from the community if they really even want dorms. We're, we're not saying we need dorms, but part we're of the problems listening. that we're hearing from the programs that are being enacted or have been looked at is there becomes a, a component of housing that, that, that becomes undeniable. At some point, we're going to have to create housing if we truly want these programs to be sustainable. And so at some point, the college is going to have to look at that, whether it's on-site housing or we, you know, the college works as a broker of some kind and, and creates some partnerships out in the community to provide that housing off-site. We're not saying it has to happen on-site, but we have over 80 acres sitting up there that's probably capable of being used for pretty much anything we want to do with it. We just have to redirect the funding in order to provide that opportunity. And that's kind of what I thought too, is you know, would there be a way we could wake, work with the community for that kind of housing? How many students are there in the Southwest Wine Center's program? About 90 people are in the community that have campus. So 91, and so many of those come from out of town? Yes, we do have some. You know, I mean, in my mind, I think in the short term, what you do is, as Randy suggested, you, you want to come up and yeah, you look towards the private sector. Oh, that's what uh, I Because that can help drive economies as well when you're looking at rental properties. But depending on how that market is and what the cost is, it can be, um, it can be difficult for students. And really, it's a question of, of the cart or the horse or the egg and the chicken. Um, if you have destination type programs, those lend themselves to people coming out of town into the Verde Valley to take specific programs. People don't come here to take gen eds not when they can get those almost anywhere and get those online. Um, so what you've got to do is really try to balance, you know, what are the needs? I think Randy is correct. Again, the, the jury's still out. Um, if you build programs that are destination type programs and you've got multiple on a campus, because I agree that that's how you build sustainability in a vibrant campus community, uh, then you have to consider at what point do you pull the trigger on housing? whether or not that be in contract with a, uh, a third party or a private or build it on campus. Um, the interesting thing about dormitories is they can be a money pit. Um, so again, you've got to weigh all those factors together. But I think that uh, it's definitely something that the college needs to look into. Um, so I think that's, again, a recommendation that we look as what is the current market, what is our student population that is coming out of county or out of state to take these programs and how can we better try to help them along on any of the other 16 items did you want to ask a question well, right ahead actually i just wanted to uh, really quickly kind of disseminate an idea on this housing part for the campus that, that could be a self-fulfilling prophecy um, <clears throat> i've been researching off and on lately over the last year the tiny house movement and there's a lot of folks that are discovering that you can build like a little house you could live in for like twenty thousand dollars but if you throw in a sustainable tiny house development class you can build your own dorms and then every other every other one you can keep and put up for the next person that comes you can sell the other one for twenty or thirty thousand dollars and it might be a self-fulfilling unit that's just kind of a real quick or that idea 80 there, acres but, could look great in the <laughs> interesting no. you could integrate you could integrate local businesses and contractors to teach people how to do it. You could get your uh, your technical education in there. You could teach people wiring, uh, you know, building trades. And it's sort of a system where it kind of goes together with the sustainable system. And a lot of those are it's solar all the rage. powered. I've seen some of the shows, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, they're a, a 
they are the wave of the future and that also is addressing itself in a lot of communities like San Francisco and places with large homeless communities because they're able to create those in a very small environment but allow people to get off the street and put people in a position where they can better themselves so I think that that might kind of blend in to do a lot of different things around. Really. Yes, I can see a good thing. One, one, of the, one of the things that's interesting is that actually is how the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture dealt with its student populations. They actually required the students to go out and build a house. Right. And I then they would sell that to the next student who would then come in and make their modifications right. and utilize what they were learning in school. Even Arco Santi would probably be a viable model to follow there because they had the same thing. One, one thing is interesting today, I was reading an article before I came about uh, a, a person that's an engineer that's working for Google is actually living in the back of a truck. It's a old rider, a box van. It's then parked in the parking lot of Google, and he's living in the truck because the housing is so unaffordable. There was four people living in a two-bedroom apartment, and it was costing each of them two thousand a month to, to just to rent this apartment. So and he, he works actually all made the time anyway, so he doesn't need much. Yeah, he, he doesn't yeah, need yeah, to be at home too often. Right, so, and they provide food and, <laughs> and housing on site, so it actually was kind of a unique way to get around it but it is starting that whole idea about living smaller and living closer uh, one of the things that we found is you know when the whole idea of student housing came up uh, the college had got into it wholeheartedly way back probably 30 years ago and back when Dr. Horton <coughs> was here the college had actually made a, uh, a, a plan to get out of student housing and, and were trying to work themselves away because as Dr. Perry said, it's a huge uh, eater of resources and time and, and uh, money. And they learn that the, they can't do some of the programs that they want to do without having housing. And, and part of this bond issue, or the 10-year the plan that was incorporated, is actually to add more student housing on the Prescott campus. And, and so that started the whole conversation about, well, we have the money. Maybe that's not the appropriate place to put the new dorm. Maybe the Verde Valley is the more appropriate appropriate place to put the dorm. The money's already funded, move the building here. One of the things we kept hearing though when we first started the meetings was a lot of, lot of uh, faculty and, and community members were saying, but my student doesn't want to live in Clarkdale. They don't want to stay here. They want to go away and get the experience of leaving home and, and going to a bigger school or, or just out of the house. Um, but what we also heard loud and clear, and I think the nation was, was uh, presented at the best was they have they they offer free tuition wherever their students want to go anywhere they they put the bill and then the students leave but the problem is, is is a lot of them come back and when they come back they wanted to have the resources here to provide that ongoing education because for whatever reason it didn't work getting out of out of home and going away so that's kind of been one of our focuses on all of this is is you know we got to provide for the students that want to leave high school and are entering the workforce locally and young but we also have to provide for the people that have left have gone away haven't been successful in their education or else have decided to come home and want to continue their education here so anything else um, dr. Perry that you would like to share from this list so it sounds it sounds expensive like you said there's I guess 5.5 million you think maybe a year that could go toward these kinds of expenses did I understand that correctly that well the, the, the numbers are fuzzy and it and it's a and it's a moving target is is uh, like the five-year and I'll get to that spreadsheet the last five years shows a very hearty ex, uh, expenditure of funding here locally a lot of that was uh, they did a huge renovation at the Clarkdale campus added a whole lot of efficiencies for heating and cooling in the pavilion and, and modernized some of the rooms. We got rid of some of the modulars that were up there. Uh, they really did a lot to increase what was there and, and as Dr. Perry say, they, they enriched the student experience of, of visiting that campus. It's an absolutely beautiful facility. Yes. Um, but that was, that was kind of an abnormality. That was not the typical. So, so while it, it presents itself that 80 percent, 80 some percent of the funding that's generated here is being put right back in, into the campus, that isn't necessarily the history or an ongoing regular event. That was, it's more of an anomaly. Uh, so we believe there's a way to get creative when, when it comes to doing anything anymore. Just as we have to do, you have to sometimes get creative and you have to figure out where it's more important to shift your funding. 
and irregardless of how much is generated here, how much is generated anywhere else, we're trying to advocate for just increasing the ability to have good opportunities locally. And we're not asking for all of our money. We're not asking for more than our money. All we're asking for is to be part of the conversation on how they provide the services they do. So we'd like to say thank you. Anything else from <coughs> council members? All right, thank you very much. And um, thank, you. thank you. And so we appreciate you serving on that committee to represent the city council. And we want to thank um, Dr. Perry for being here tonight and um, board member Al Filardo also. Okay, the next item is um, call to the public. Um, call to the public. This portion of the agenda is set aside for the public to address the council regarding an item that is not listed on the agenda for discussion. However, the council cannot engage in discussion regarding any item that is not officially listed on the agenda for discussion and or action. Comments are limited to a five minute time period. So is there anyone um, from the public who would like to speak about an item that's not on the agenda. If not, we'll close the floor to the... Got one, got one. Okay, yes. And there's a form there, the little yellow sheet, if you could grab that and fill it out later <coughs> so that we will be able to spell your name right in the minutes. And you can go ahead and speak first if you like. Yeah, go ahead and... We just want to get your name spelled right, and that's pretty hard to do sometimes without you telling us how. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm Phil Hess. I live at uh, four, uh, 724 North 5th Street, and uh, at this time, it's my winter home. I have a home in Iowa as well. Uh, I've got a problem with the water, the new water system, and so forth that was put in over there. Uh, there was a power surge, and I'm very certain of that, that blew a valve under my house. Uh, I wasn't here, of course. I just got back. And I get a bill for over 240,000 gallon of water. Uh, in my opinion, that had we been notified that New Line was going to be run there with a possibility of water surge, and there's always that anytime you put in a new line because you got more water volume and more pressure, that uh, say we're going to, there's a possibility of a water surge or a possibility of higher pressure, you might want to have a regulator put on your line for these older homes that have water pipes in there for years and years. Had we been notified of that, I would have taken care of it and we wouldn't have had a 20 year supply of amount of water that went out and I'm getting charged for it. Had we been given the courtesy of knowing that this was going to happen, and then if we didn't do something about it, then I think that we could be responsible. But in this, the way it was done, nobody was notified. I have neighbors down the street that had problems as well, and one of them was here, had to leave earlier. He was going to talk too. Uh, that had a, a blown line under his house and cost him, of course, he had damage to his house plus the extra water bill, but he was there, so it was only run for a little while. And so I don't know how much was his water bill over and above, but the way he talked, it was probably at least double what it normally would be for that month. And, and of course, the insurance paid the bill, the damage to his house but he still had to pay a thousand dollar deductible which in my opinion the problem came from the other side of the meter 
and I know we're responsible for the lines on our side of the meter, but when something from the other side of the meter has caused it, I think the city, the water company, should take a little bit of responsibility for that. And I'm not asking for full recovery of the $2,100 that is, I'm getting billed for water, but I think they should take some responsibility for it. So um, could we just ask the city manager to meet with Mr. Hess and with your staff and try to resolve some of these challenges and issues that he's mentioning? Yeah, and absolutely, ma'am. Okay, so if you would just, um, do you have a card with you that you could give to him so he could contact you? So our city manager is going to meet with you and talk about all of those issues. Okay, very good. We appreciate you coming and sharing information with okay. us. Thank you. Thank you. So if you just give him a call and he'll set up an appointment okay. with you. <coughs> all right. Thank you, you very much for thank your you. time. Anybody else want to speak? Okay. Moving on to the next item is approval of the minutes. I read them and they looked fine to me. Did anybody else say anything that you meant? So I would entertain a motion. I move we approve the minutes of October 6th. Second it. Mr. Elinsky made the motion. The mayor seconded it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Comments regarding items listed on the agenda are limited to a five minute time period per speaker. Item number 11, consent agenda. The following items are considered to be routine and non-controversial by the council and will be approved by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member or a citizen so requests, in which case the item will be removed from the consent agenda and considered in its normal sequence on the agenda. Item number one is agreement with the Yavapai County School Superintendent for E-rate services for the Cottonwood Public Library. And that is the only item. Does anyone, uh, let's see. So that's on the consent agenda. That's me. Okay, so does anybody want to pull that item for discussion? Does anybody from the public want to pull the item for discussion? If not, I'd entertain a motion. Mr. Howdigy. A motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Okay, Mr. Howdigy made the motion and the vice mayor seconded it. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Sorry you had to stay here all night just for that. <laughs> Thank you for being here. We appreciate you. Okay, new business. The following items are for council discussion, consideration, and possible legal action. Item number one is resolution number 2815, approving an intergovernmental agreement with the Arizona State Parks <coughs> Board to assist Dead Horse Ranch State Park with the operation of their potable water and wastewater collections systems and allow the city to utilize the park's lift station to extend the city's sewer service area. Mr. Biggs. You pretty well covered it. <laughs> Good evening, <laughs> Mayor. Uh, yes, this is a, an extension of, a, of an agreement that was signed in, in 2011, or a new agreement to take its place. Uh, the city and the Dead Horse State Park are excellent neighbors. We've been providing technical and operational assistance for their staff for the operations of their water and wastewater systems. Uh, the new agreement provides for the city to make connections into the park's primary lift station located at the uh, front entrance of the park. This is a method for the city to extend our sewer collection system in a very economical manner and uh, the city would be required uh, to pay costs associated with the connections and any additional costs over the parks operation of this lift station but it's a, a very uh, like I said ec economical manner so um, any questions please Mr. Pratt, okay yes Ma Mr. Mayor, let, me, let me give a little bit of background on this too not only is this a renewal of an agreement, but this was also a, a solution to a uh, problem um, that was brought to us by um, the Mayberries, and, and uh, they wanted to uh, expand their offerings out at Blaze and M to allow for overnight stays by bringing in some uh, prefab cabins. And, and um, the challenge was how do we 
provide wastewater treatment for them out there. And so this was a, a really good collaboration between the state parks, the Maybury's, and the city to get this, uh, get this accomplished. And so it allows them to move for, forward in a, a more economical way uh, to go ahead and connect up to a wastewater system, which works out better for everybody and the environment by being able to take that waste and, and uh, recycle it and use it again. So um, our thanks to State Parks and uh, Deputy Director uh, Kelly Moffitt and George uh, Christensen. Uh, it was a great cl collaboration to get this done. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Christensen, thank you for being here tonight. Um, Dead Horse State Park Manager, and did you have anything you wanted to add, or were you here to answer questions if they came up? Either, either. Well, if you'd like to come up and... I just, I just want to thank the city for its continued uh, uh, helping operate the collections and, and the potable water system, and, and it's, uh, like I said, it has been a great collaborative effort. We do so much partnering on so many events and stuff. And, and this is, like I say, a great opportunity to be able to uh, continue to further enhance the, the area's growth and stuff by being able to. And this was a process of, to have the public recall. This process started when state parks took a huge hit in their budget. And we were all, as Verde Valley cities and towns, we were all looking at ways that we could collaborate to keep them in business because they do bring a great deal of economic um, development or economic security or they, they um, pay into the economy just by being there. We know that people that stay there, you know, get gas, they go out to eat, they shop in stores. Um, so that it is a boost to our economy and we didn't, uh, even though Dead Horse is self-sustaining, it's one of the few parks uh, that maybe is, but it's, um, we, all, we wanted to help. And Camp Verde and Yavapai County helped in different ways, I think more with um, Fort Verde State Park, but the city looked at and talked with parks on how we could be a partner to keep our parks here and that is what the council and staff, um, with the staff's recommendation also decided was that we could do the water and wastewater work. So I'm happy to say it's been a great partnership. It worked so well that we forgot to renew the agreement. <laughs> um, but that's what we're trying to do here tonight. And then the Mayberries, I don't know if you wanted to, do you have any comments that you want to make at all? Um, come on up if you do. Thanks. Thank you so much. Lori Mabry, and I'm managing partner for Blazon M Ranch and Mayor and Council. We, we appreciate, again, a successful collaboration. Um, we approached our, our issues, and they were dealt with efficiently and, and expeditiously. And we just think that we're, we're there to provide even the next level, which was kind of the total vision of what we started 21 years ago, was to create the overnight lodging there on our property. And with the growth of our area and the wine industry, we feel like even more so than ever, there's a demand there. So. We appreciate the support and, and efforts, and we hope that we can see our vision come to fruition. So thank you. Okay. And so I know that Roger probably has a few words to say because it's his team that goes out, and I was reading you spend about 25 hours a month. Yeah, less than an hour a day. Yeah. And uh, I, I think the, the crew actually kind of enjoys it. Uh, it's, it's a little different. We're already in Riverfront Park, so this is just a... A short trip over the bridge. They get to go to Dead Horse, Dead Horse and they don't have to pay uh -huh. to get in, right? There you go. <laughs> What's not I to like about to that? <laughs> they do inspections and, and sampling and uh, recharge the disinfection systems. And uh, it's really quite a, a great relationship between the two parties. Fantastic. Mr. Pratt. Yeah, this is, this is clearly a win-win-win for all parties. It's, Blazing M adds a lot to our community. Dead Horse adds a lot to our community. They bring people here, they spend money, and we've had a great relationship. It helps us with our loop system. So this is ultimately a no-brainer. No <laughs> and it really was, I um, said in a couple of meetings with the city manager and the <coughs> staff and you know, problem solving, trying to think of how could we work this out and you know, I mean, uh, Kelly Moffat, he was like, well, we'll try to do something, and 
and it's just pretty amazing that you can get uh, several governmental entities together and come up with a plan like this that is a win for everyone and so thank you very much for your work on that I know that you kept on it and and made sure that something happened and I know that George did too so thank you very much yeah we're not always real fast but well, we'll get to it eventually. <laughs> but it worked. Persistent. But you got it done. I mean, that is wonderful. So, okay, I would. Um, any comments from any more members of the public on this item? If not, I would entertain a motion, Mr. Sure. Pratt. I move or, to approve resolution number 2815. Second. Okay, so um, Mr. Pratt made the motion. The vice mayor seconded it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mm -hmm. Motion carries. Deputy Clerk, please read resolution number 2815. Resolution number 2815, a resolution of the Mayor and City Council of the City of Cottonwood, Arizona, approving an intergovernmental agreement with the Arizona State Parks Board to assist Dead Horse, Dead Horse Ranch State Park with the operation of its potable water and wastewater collection systems and to allow the city to utilize the park's lift station to expand and improve the city's wastewater collection and treatment capabilities. Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Next item is special event wine festival license, wine fair licenses for Pillsbury Wine Company North. Ferretas Vineyard, Arizona Stronghold Vineyard, Cellar 433, Page Spring Cellars and Vineyards, Pierce Wines, Arizona, Dancing Apache Ranch, 48 Wineworks, Caduceus Cellars, Burning Tree Cellars, Cotton Tucky, Passion Cellars, at Salvatore Vineyards and Winery 101, for the walking on main event scheduled for November 14th, 2015. Mr. Allen. Mayor, uh, yes. I'm I'm a member of the Verde Valley Wine Consortium, and we're a partner on this event, so I will claim Goodbye. a conflict of interest. <laughs> okay. Please note the record, Deputy Clerk. Uh, Madam Mayor and Council, um, for the most part, this is pretty standard protocol. Every year we submit these applicants' applications, and uh, they go through the approval process um, or consideration from through the Council, and then we send them down to the state. I think the reason this was pulled from the consent agenda is because we had Winery 101 that was added later um, once the, the uh, notice doc was completed. So um, pretty much standard as usual with walking on Main and the wineries here listed. Any questions, Mr. Pratt? Um, two in a row, no brainer. Uh -huh. Why would we not approve this? We have walking on Main set up. Uh, we have all these <coughs> wineries committed to coming here. It's always very well controlled, the Verde Valley. So it's just an asset to the city. If we said no, then that would destroy walking on Main. So this one, I'm, I'm kind of surprised it wasn't on the consent agenda. But he said that it was it pulled. Oh, for I'm sorry, I missed it when I. Okay. Um, and usually, because we have a member that has to declare a conflict, those aren't on the consent agendas because mm. we have to pull them anyway. Okay, so I would, any comments from the public on this item? If not, I'd entertain a motion. Vice Mayor, I'll, you want to? I'll, I'll read the You are going to do motion. it? Okay, Mr. Dowling's going to do it. Okay. okay. I move to recommend approval of the special event wine festival wine fair license applications for the walking on main event scheduled for November 14th, 2015, submitted by Pillsbury Wine Company North, Freitas Vineyard, Arizona Stronghold Vineyards, Cellar 433, Page Springs Cellars and Vineyards, Pierce Wines, Arizona, Dancing Apache Ranch, 48 Wine Works, Caduceus Cellars, Burning Tree Cellars, Cotton Tucky, Passion Cellars at Salvatore Vineyards, and Winery 101. Second. Mr. Dowling <coughs> made the motion. Mr. Pratt seconded it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> All right, item number three, ordinance number 616, amending section 308, medical marijuana facilities, subsection C3, medical marijuana cultivation facilities, and medical marijuana infusion <coughs> facilities of the city's zoning ordinance. And this is a first reading. There will be no action taken tonight. So, um, Mr. Scully. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Uh, city Council considered this issue at your September work session 
I can direct the uh, staff to follow up with the ordinance prepared. It also went to the Planning and Zoning Commission at their September meeting. And as noted in your report, they had a lively discussion as well. And it was similar to the range of topics, I think, that the council had. But they did recommend uh, forwarding it for consideration. The, uh, and the, also, since the uh, works, work session last month, there was uh, some research done after the discussion from the council, uh, looking at uh, there's a, a list and then there's a table that sort of summarizes that. Uh, looked at, uh, including Cottonwood, 20 cities and what they were doing as a basic summary, as well as 10 counties. Uh, it's emphasis on some rural communities and small communities. I think the, what you see right away is that there's a range of approaches from just going with the basics, minimum state statute, and then looking at uh, a few communities just uh, do their standard zoning. If uh, it's cultivation, they do it just as an industrial use, and then uh, the uh, dispensary is more like just a commercial use. And then on the other side, there's uh, a number of these ordinances are fairly restrictive and limiting. The uh, broke, broke out that table in looking at the, the size issue, the maximum uh, size, and you can see that that is not as uh, widely used. There was only about 30 percent of the cities and the county. And this is as a sample, as a survey. It's really. Uh, uh, you'd have to look at more to find out what the actual number is statewide. But just as, as a random survey here, uh, that approach was uh, less common, where the emphasis seems to be is in about uh, two-thirds of the communities. They do have a range of setbacks from various uses. In addition to the minimum on the uh, state statute, which was the 500-foot uh, distance from the K-12 schools. They add all kinds of other things too, commonly churches, parks, public facilities. Um, and uh, some of them seem, there's other random things. It seems like bowling alleys and, uh, uh, and that's sort of across the board. They were just uh, putting the facilities, whether it was a dispensary, or a, a separate cultivation facility. Um, and then there's some communities like uh, Prescott and Tucson, you have know, Pike County, where they just kind of went with the straight zoning. So um, that was the information from that approach. In the ordinance, uh, based on the, the uh, input from the existing cultivation facility in uh, Cottonwood here to wa wanting to expand. There were four, section, um, four sections that were uh, sentences, really, four sentences that were amended to accomplish that. Two of them were deleted. One was a new section added to give more flexibility to the infusion facilities. And then one was just uh, had some amendments to it. So it's a fairly straightforward um, consideration, I think, to accomplish that flexibility. It just changes a few small parts. Um, <clears throat> did a lot of research on what's going on in other states, if you're interested in what's going around in the United States. There's 23 states that now have some form of uh, medical marijuana legalization. There's four states that have the recreational uh, legal legalization, including Oregon, which just uh, this month switched from uh, their, their medical marijuana system to a recreational marijuana system. And they uh, just uh, since October 1st, they apparently sold $11 million worth of product in the first week. So that's going on out in other states. <clears throat> uh, the uh, uh, that's that's pretty much it, I guess. If there if there is an interest in allowing the 
cultivation facility to expand, then there's a way to change just a couple of sentences in the ordinance. Or, uh, or so we did have, I guess, a work session on this and did discuss it. Comments from members of the council? Thoughts? Mr. Garrison? I got a comment. Um, and it's kind of a sidebar, but, but it, it stems from this being an agenda item tonight. Is I, I had quite a few discussions with members of the community over the last two weeks on this item because there was some confusion about exactly what it was that we were doing. Uh, I relayed that it was we were dealing with an, a zoning ordinance issue and not on marijuana and how it's distributed or any of that itself. But I guess what I'm getting out of the discussions I've been having is there's a lot of um, there's a lot of concern within the community about uh, marijuana and medical marijuana and recreational marijuana and how how the city is going to deal with it, how the state is going to deal with it if if it in fact gets approved in November of next year. So my suggestion would be that uh, if if this does actually go to uh, go to the ballot and get put on the ballot, is that um, the city look at being a little um, proactive and maybe setting up some type of a community uh, awareness forum uh, where people can come and, and at least talk, find out what's what the realities are of the situation, or what the restraints are that are faced by the city and and the state in dealing with these things, and and uh, allow these people to you know have their their time to you know express express their frustrations or concerns about what's going on or share their their uh, vision of where this could actually go positive or negative so that that's that's what I want to say is I just I'm hoping I won't be around at that point so I'm hoping that somebody at that in that time of year will uh, actually be capable of, of getting that put together and and having a community forum so people can come in and talk to you about it so, so uh, I kind of lost me here. So, are we talking medical issue? Or are we talking the recreational issue? Uh, you kind of lost the, me. The, the 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 bulk of it was just marijuana. This they they, okay. they don't weren't, there was no distinction being made, and and so you know you had to make a distinction. Uh, I had to explain the differences between those and and the the restrictions on on dealing with uh, medical. Uh, mostly they were just concerned about marijuana entering the community and how the city was going to deal with that. And I explained that this is already here, right. this is a zoning issue, this was about buildings and placement. It had nothing to do with the availability or the use thereof. So uh, that, that's all. There was just a lot of frustration, a lot of questions, a lot of concern. And they felt the need to get some answers and so I thought it would be advantageous for the city to be proactive and actually create a forum where people could come in and, and be made aware of, of exactly what the restrictions are or you know what the city's doing to deal with this issue at some time in the future I, I would recommend waiting till at least it gets put on the ballot so you know the, then it's a real concern not not something that's futuristic so ever. how will the city <coughs> answer their questions if something's going on a ballot well I think the 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 I think it would be uh, a face-to-face -face with the city manager, with our police chief at the time, and uh, with some members of the council to maybe express, and the lawyer, I think the city lawyer, Ms. Thorne, would be a great asset at that. I think a lot of it comes down to people just not understanding what, what's, what the requirements are and what the rights are. And so we would get, those, we would get, get the of, initiative and we would, as city, explain what the initiative no I think is. the initiative will be pretty straightforward I think it'll be whether right. you vote up or down recreational marijuana their concern is how is that going to impact the community and so I think it would be uh, on our side to at least hear their concerns maybe alleviate some of the misconceptions of what that'll do and and what the city's responsibilities are in dealing with it and, and it just at least give people the forum to be able to express their concerns and and hopefully get get good information but, but as far as this here what we're talking about here is expanding these distances between buildings and where they can grow that really has really nothing to do with has nothing to do with this this is zoning right that, okay but, but okay. everybody that's called me so far has had 
the other side of that. They didn't understand this yeah. was a zoning I, issue. I've had a lot of people consumers. talk to me about this this week too. And, and you know, at the end of the day, there was a lot of misinformation that they had. I mean, and uh, almost to a T, they were off on one tangent and not dealing with what we were looking at here. You know, and I'm not advocating for this and that we're against it at this point. But it is an agenda item that's pretty direct on yeah, what we're dealing and, with. And, and, and that's fine. Is, is anybody asking to have this, I mean, how did this come forward to, ch to change these uh, guidelines? As far as uh, I know, that, it, it came from a representative of the... Uh, I can probably respond to that, um, Council Member Hardeke. Um Staff and the mayor were approached by uh, Council Member Dowling and... Mr. Downing, who is interested in uh, expanding the 10,000 square foot uh, cultivation facility we have in the city now. And so there was a request at that point to bring the ordinance before the council for consideration. And, and Mr. Downing is who? Mr. Downing is uh, Dimitri Gentleman Downing. Hey, okay. Behind Mr. Big Scully there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> public needs to know as well, and it was one of the considerations from day one, which was um, in the way the state law was written, there, the opportunity to have uh, people grow in their home in a way that wasn't, they could get licensed from the state if they were not within 25 miles of a dispensary, mm -hmm. uh, and that, um, that, was a, that was a consideration that factored into the discussions about whether to uh, put up roadblocks and try to minimize things or whether to kind of work with it because the, uh, the alternative was to consider, and I know that there's patients that would have preferred it that way to just be able to grow in their home because there was no, there's no uh, inspection process by the state and it's a fairly loose part of the system. Uh, and that this law was written and really a key part of it was this whole delivery system being through an organized approach that is uh, more controlled and what the product is and how it goes out. And so that was a factor. And so in the system, the state authorized it to come to a, a zone. There would be one dispensary in the Verde, this part of the Verde Valley and it happened to be in Cotton. It could have been in the county. It could have been some other city around in, in this one, but it was only going to be one. And, and we didn't select them, they, the state selected them. So that was just kind of a key background part. We were working with that. So if people thought that the city was doing something, either pro or con, there was, there was another factor that was just part of the overall discussion. And that's how it ended up. That was just how the facts worked out. So, Vice Mayor, you've had your hand up very um, patiently. I know that the voters voted this in, and, and I know it's a zoning issue, but it's also a zoning issue on an illegal operation, according to the federal government. And for the last five decades, I've watched the carnage and damage this legal drug has done to the country and to the communities, and um, uh, I'm not in support of doing something illegal against the federal government. So I'm totally opposed to it and what it does to our communities. So uh, are we discussing the recreational or medical or overall? Overall. Okay. But right now, I know it's a zoning issue, but like I said, it's a zoning issue on an illegal operation in my, in my eyes. But we have to consider this, and, and the state of Arizona does allow it, so. Uh, I understand. That's just anyway. my view. Mr. Dow. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, Key Manager, Council Members. My name is Dimitri Downing. I'm here on behalf of AOW to answer any questions that the council might have or staff. Council, do you have questions for Mr. Downing? I don't have any questions. I was hoping you'd give us some information on, on your side, on your feelings on, on this issue. Well, the Arizona Medical Marijuana Act is a voter-passed act here in Arizona. It's voter-protected. It's not going anywhere. 
it's it's accepted across the state government that it's here to stay. The Department of Health Services is regulating it. The Attorney General is overseeing it. There's the process is happening. What we found uh, across Arizona is that different jurisdictions, you know, pulled out of thin air ideas on how to regulate this industry. Some made sense. Some didn't made se make sense. Uh, we have a facility here in Cottonwood. We could easily go and take it to a jurisdiction like Phoenix or Tucson that has that didn't put any particular size restrictions on the amount of cultivation that could be produced. Many jurisdictions didn't. Why some did, why some didn't, there's different reasons and different, just different justifications as to why they did. A lot of them are operating on misconceptions or bad information. Uh, the reality is it's here to stay. It's, it's not going anywhere absent the voters overturning the Medical Marijuana Act. The economic opportunity is what we're looking at here for the city of Cottonwood. It's the reason why Tucson and some other jurisdictions have changed their ordinance to remove this restriction to make it more business friendly. And that's all we're asking for here. We're not asking for an endorsement or support of medical or adult use marijuana. That's not the issue. It's strictly a zoning issue. And we want to stay here. We want to invest here in Cottonwood. We want to bring jobs to Cottonwood. We like the town. Um, you know, we hope that you guys accept us. Okay, well, that's, that's part of an answer. Well, I guess I, I kind of instigated some of this, so I'll, maybe it would be more clear. Um, for example, just as an example, right now they're in a building that has 16,000 available square feet in it. And the city says you can only use 10,000. So I sort of looked at it as equivocating, you know, if, if I had a 1,600 square foot house, and then somebody said basically you're only, used, only allowed to use 1,000 square feet of that home, that, that room is off limits. That's kind of how I equivocated it. So if basically what th I understand is they're just attempting to be able to use the entire structure that they're in, rather than having to sort of draw a tape line across it and say, we can only use that portion. So that was really the basic, um, that's basically how I understood it. And I saw that that thin taped line or the, the 10,000 square foot limit, you know, basically being a, a cutoff to development as far as, you know, how many jobs that could go for. So if, if we pull that line back, we might actually get, mm -hmm. you know, some, uh, you know, get some real, some jobs here. Those jobs normally aren't uh, low paying and they're normally, you know, they usually all have background checks and they go through quite a bit to do it. So I just saw the ability, you know, for us to walk the walk on the economic friendliness. Well, you, you're, you were a lot clearer than what I heard previously, you know, so I appreciate that. So, but I, I do have a question, though, referring to this 16, what, hundred or thousand? 16,000. Thousand. Okay, yeah, those big numbers for me. Yes. And they can only use a 10. What if they were in a, in a would this have come forward if this facility was in a 10,000 square foot building? I guess that's my point, because what you're telling me is that they should have the ability to use this entire 16,000 foot building sure because because they're in it but if they were in a 10,000 right square foot building would would this have come forward i guess that's one of the questions i don't know that that would have it would have been as necessary as, as much of a necessity i don't know the, the reality is, is is we wouldn't have brought it forward um because just the the economic the business aspects of what's happening in the medical marijuana space would have suggested we go to yavapai uh Excuse me, we go to Prescott or some other different jurisdictions where they're, they don't have restrictions on the particular size that the, uh, that the project can expand to. And so that's basically what we're looking at is being able to expand as we need to. And we happen to have a 16,000 square foot facility, but okay, it could have been 18,000. So at this point, you're, 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 you're referring to the fact that you have to grow at this point. Yes. You have to produce more product. Yes. Okay, so that's that's the whole crux of this, right? Well, yes, we have to we have to be in a facility that allows for expansion. It would be like suggesting to a brewery that they can only brew in a three thousand square foot building or two thousand square foot building, et cetera. And there are certain things that, like, I guess I've looked into it a bit. There's like an economy of scale there. So, for example, down in Tucson, I think they had 
uh, this is an example, I don't know the exact number, but they might have set their limit at like 3,000 square feet. So what that would lead to is, and then, you know, somebody would have to have like three 3,000 square foot buildings to maintain, and they'd have to maintain three separate buildings in order to have enough, of, you know, so it's a matter of maintaining multiple facilities or a single facility, and then you have your, you know, a large investment, like if you're going to bring, uh, if you're going to invest the money in that single facility, then it pays, you know, you've got your economy of scale. You've got everything in one place. You don't have to have people spread all over. You don't have four different utility bills, four water bills, and all that. So it's, it's just really basic economics. I understand, but were, were those rules in place when this facility decided to open up and, and function in three different buildings? Uh, they were, as far as I understand, they, they were in place before? from the get-go. So there was knowledge of that, you know. And the same thing here. These things were in place prior to, to uh, this gentleman opening up their facility. Yes. Okay. So um, I know that, that um, you do have a relationship, but not a conflict in, in the, to uh, ensure that there's no perception of a conflict. If you want to go ahead and let the public know the relationship, my relationship is with the city of Cottonwood and its taxpayers and its employees. Uh, my office is uh, located adjacent to this operation. The only conflict that will arise from it, if it gets to expand, is I will probably have to pack my office up and find a new and location. Find a new location. So just to make sure. I do not stand no one... to, to gain from this financially. The only thing I care about at this point is walking the walk. I'm business friendly, and developing jobs and taxes in the city. And thank you very much for that explanation. So, so can I ask anybody who wants to answer, how many people currently work at, at the established facility now? Well, I brought three of our staff members here, Jen Goat, Kiyoki Wee, and, and Casey. Oh, they're over here. Um, right now we have a limited staff because we're deciding what to do. We're holding back on a $1 million capital injection into that building to build out and to bring jobs and economic development, Cottonwood, because it wouldn't make sense for us to stay at this structure. We would just move to Phoenix or Prescott or some other place where there, are, you know, where the ordinance makes a little bit more sense okay. in regards to the okay. business. Putting decision. that aside, how many people are, are we looking at working there if this gets approved or, the, or the, changed, the, I should say? It, the immediate impact would be, you know, contractors working, electricians working, plumbers working, people in the, in the community working. Once it was built out, we would have ongoing AC contracts. We would have 14 to 20 people working at the facility and the potential for expansion for more, uh, depending on what happens in the future in America. So right now the building is currently in use. So, so what, what, what is a contractor going to do now? I mean, isn't the building there now? The building is there now. Um, over the past, some of the, the Mr. Downing has invited some of the council members a while back to come. I think it's gone through the clerk's office, um, and some of this was explained. The contractor was here during the work session and explained it via a local contractor. Uh, I missed what that. would yeah? I, I'm just trying to bring you up to speed. Yeah. Thank um, you. What would end up happening is they'd probably go in and build out. Right now, it's just a big empty space, and they're doing some temporary. They're doing temporary enclosures. They would actually be able to go in and put in actual walls and partitions and structures, hang actual light, you know, basically build it out in a finished fashion. Right now, they're sort of in limbo waiting to see how it's going to come out. But it would actually involve, like Mr. Downey, Downey said, um, about three quarters of a million to a million dollars as far as building and walls and APS, I think, is going to have to come in and do that. And they've got AC contracts and all the, all the things that go along with it. So that's really, it, they're just sort of in limbo right now. And, and we as a, as a operation had to make a decision this summer because of the rapidness of the expansion as to whether or not to continue with a smaller 10,000 square foot facility uh, that's allowed by Cottonwood. The facility has been operating without incident. The fire department has been through there, excuse me, operating without incident yeah, most of the year. That's really not my yeah. concern there. I'm just trying to get basics over here. You know, that's, that's a whole different issue right there. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Dowling. Any other questions, <coughs> Mr. Garrison? 
No, I, like I said, I just want to reiterate that you know there was just a lot of misconception about what we were doing tonight, a lot of concern, and, and uh, even though it doesn't directly relate to what we're dealing with tonight, I think it will moving forward. And I would you know once again make a plea to to be proactive and put together some type of a forum where people can learn a little more about what may or may not be impacting their community. I, I would agree with what, with what Mr. Garrison was suggesting. I think it'd be good to have a community forum to get people more educated. And, you know, we discussed this at length at our work session, and um, you know, I don't I don't advocate for the medical marijuana, um, but we are looking at a zoning issue and a business that wants to expand here. Um, state already did approve this, so it's our duty to abide by state law and I just don't want to see that we have any restrictions when a business wants to grow in our community it's it's an industry it's not an industry that I uh, support but it is an industry that's come to Cottonwood and uh, the voters have approved so again getting back you know separating that from from the zoning issue at hand I, I see no reason why we shouldn't allow a business to expand and we have a, a speaker Kyla Allen. Apache Street. I do have an issue with the way that it's being presented. This is a zoning issue. This gentleman's a businessman. He moved into a structure that he knew he couldn't use all of it. Why now are we allowing it and, and amending our ordinance to help this gentleman be able to have a bigger growth? He knew the law before he got in there. I don't move into a 3,000 square foot house knowing I can't use that room. I look at the law and I follow that law. Now for us to have to compensate and bend over for somebody that comes in, they know the law, three quarters of a million or not, I don't care. He knew the law when he came in here and he's gonna make us change it so that he can have a bigger grow. When he keeps throwing in our face, he's got Prescott or Phoenix or wherever else he can go to. Fine, don't come in here and try to change everything to compensate and make it so that you can grow more marijuana. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Hodegi, I can tell your thinking. You know, you know, I think the best at this time, if I may, may add that we uh, go ahead and adjourn because we have another meeting that discuss the rest of this, okay? Because what <laughs> doesn't have to get to that big emotional position, you know. And, and, and I think it would be best to uh, go ahead and, and uh, continue this in our next meeting. Since so, so we're not going to vote on it tonight anyhow. Well, since we're, we're not, not going to vote, vote on this anyway. <clears throat> yeah. and, and, and what usually happens, we sit here for about an hour and everything is repeated <laughs> that was said an hour before. And, and basically, uh, after all the years I've been on this council, uh, I've seen it over and over, so that's what I expect to happen. So it's not going to matter if we sit here tonight and list to emotional statements and such. You know, we can come back and, and handle it in a business matter in the next meeting, which we have another meeting coming up. I agree. I agree. I agree. Good point. Madam so, Mayor, yes, I would like to make a comment. Okay, please. You know, I I don't usually comment on things, but I I think this is an important decision for the council. Um, I agree that it's a it's a zoning decision. But I think it's important to recognize that the council sets policy even on zoning decisions. They create the culture of the community even on zoning uh, cases. For the past 10 years, at least since I've been here, we've worked diligently to try and get rid of the druggy reputation that Cottonwood has had. Um, you guys have led the way with pseudoephedrine behind the counters. Um, bath salts, you dealt with that. Um, you signed a resolution to um, do, to, you know, oppose legalization of marijuana. Um, when Mr. Downing came in to present this idea, it wasn't just 16,000 square feet. He wants to make the biggest marijuana cultivation campus in the state. That's what he told us. Now, is that the message that we want to send about Cottonwood? Particularly to our most vulnerable uh, citizens, our, our young people. Because not only are we saying 
marijuana is okay, it's okay for everybody, but we're also saying you can pick and choose the laws you want to you wanna follow because it is illegally federal. Well, well, that's true, but it's also legally in the state and it's been accepted that way. And we're talking here about a medical marijuana that was approved by the citizens of this state. We're not talking it's about still drugs illegal, out in the federal, street and such. And, and, and your position, I'm sure, has a lot to do with your background well, in does. law enforcement, and there's no doubt about it, you know. It, and, and that's fine. But we're not here to, to discuss that tonight. Um, my point, Madam my Mayor, point is, is that can I make not, my comments? That, yes, please. You weren't done? No, I wasn't. Okay, so just a few more minutes. Um, I think the other thing is it, it sends a, a, a message to our businesses and potential businesses. We've already heard from Malden Graphics during an economic summit that they can't find employees who can pass a drug test. There are businesses waiting to see what this state does in 2016 in terms of the legalization. This is, and again, this gets back to an important policy issue that the council's making. Medical marijuana is legal. Pornography, strip clubs are legal. But do we want to encourage those kind of businesses in cotton? I, I would just encourage the council to look at this more than just a zoning decision. And again, it doesn't have to be an all or no, a nothing issue. I mean, if, if he needs 16,000 square foot, then maybe we up it to 16,000 square foot or 20,000 square foot. But why does it have to be just open-ended? Because we're not a Tucson, we're not a Phoenix. And, and so why, you know, just say there's no limitation at all? And, and so again, I, I would just ask the council to consider that. Okay. Did, can I say just yes, Mr. Yeah, Hedigan. Another 30 seconds before I go. I, I don't think they're asking for open-ended here. There, there's actual square footage that, if, if this is if changed, that it would go. For, uh, and, and I can't quote the square footage, and it doesn't matter. But there's actual parameters on the square footage. So to state that it's open-ended, I think is. It's just not true. Well, it, it is true. There is no limitation on the square footage they can develop based on the changes to the ordinance. I did read it that way, so. Mr. Downing. If I may, the manager said, oh, we're, we're not looking to build the biggest cultivation in the state. There's a 20-acre grow going up in Kingman, there's Wilcox, not, not just Tucson Phoenix, Wilcox has a uh, three acre uh, greenhouse, Santa Cruz County, across the state and jurisdictions that allow for expansion. That's where the money, that's where the jobs are going. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. We are limited also by the size of the property. You know, I mean, if, if I don't even know how big the property is, but that is the limitation that we would be experiencing. So, you know, we're not looking to build the biggest cultivation in the state. Those already exist in other rural jurisdictions, not just Tucson and Phoenix. And as a matter of fact, the rural jurisdictions is where they're going to be going, where there's more and more land. Uh, we just happen to love the location. We like Cottonwood. It's, you know, nice people. We found a great local contractor, people we want to work with. We want to stay. That's why we want to change the ordinance. Okay, so did Chief, did you want to say something quick? And then um, I would take Mr. Hadegi's recommendation to. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Um, I'm listening to all this and, and I'm, I'm a little bit concerned and, and quite confused. As you know, I've, I've been here for about 30 years and my job has been to clean up our community. When I started here, everybody knew that marijuana was the main thing you find in Cottonwood because our mountain was covered in marijuana groves. We've cleaned that up. We had our meth problems. We cleaned that up. We've had our prescription drug problems. We've cleaned that up. <clears throat> and now I'm listening to our council discuss whether or not we want to allow, whether it's legal or not, by state law. And I, I would point out to everybody that's talking about it, voter agreed the vote in Yavapai County did not support medical marijuana and the voters in Cottonwood did not support medical marijuana. It was Pinal County and Pima County. 
Um, but regardless, we're now talking about telling our kids and our, and, our, and our families in this town, okay, we've cleaned up all these drug problems, but now we're just going to go ahead and grow as much marijuana as we possibly can. And I find it interesting that everybody keeps saying it's no more dangerous than alcohol. Well, there's the key point there, no more dangerous. So is that like, why would we say, okay, it's no more dangerous, but go ahead and use it. They're automatically admitting it's dangerous. I'm not saying alcohol is good for you. I don't think it is. That's why we arrest people for DUI and everything else. But why do we want to, as a community, once again say, here we are, we've cleaned up all these problems, but now we're going to go ahead and grow as much marijuana as we possibly can for whatever reason. And it, doesn't, it does not benefit our community. How does it benefit our community? Six or seven jobs, eight jobs, maybe a contractor that gets a little bit of extra work for a few months. That, to me, is not the impact that's going to benefit our community. There are so many other things you as a council can do to benefit our community rather than to grow marijuana and tell everybody that we don't care what happens to it, where it goes, what's happening. Right now, as a police chief, the new thing that we are seeing is the heroin problem. We're killing people with heroin. Cocaine's coming across the border at 400% more than it was in the last two years. Why is that? The cartels have learned they can't grow marijuana and sell it in the, area, in the United States because we're now passing laws. So, okay, they've, they've adapted their economics and they're bringing more cocaine, more heroin up here to kill our people. And again, we're going to say, yep, we're going to grow more marijuana so you can send more cocaine up here because we're not going to let you have marijuana. It's very confusing, it's very, it's very concerning to me and to law enforcement as, as a whole that we want to give that image and tell people that marijuana is okay and we're going to grow it no matter what. Um, I strongly urge you to seriously think hard about it. We set a limit. The council was happy with the limit. It allows him to be a businessman. It allows him to profit. And he's the only one profiting it, him and his crew. They're the only people profiting. None of us are. Nobody in our community, maybe five or six people. Not really worth it to me. And everybody knows whether you want to believe it or not, marijuana does hurt people. You won't find a dead heroin addict that did not use marijuana first. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, okay, so one more. Okay, so I'm sorry, Mr. Hedegi. <laughs> hey, I pretty, much, I pretty much had enough. We're going Mr. around the now. If, if you don't mind. There's a lot of uh, people that are passionate about their jobs, and I appreciate the city manager's passion. I appreciate the police chief's passion. But we have a, a, a community here that's been struggling for a long time trying to get uh, medical anything. We've got a medic. This is medical marijuana. It's legal. They're bringing jobs to the community. It's low water usage. It's everything that we ask for. If you look at our economic plan for the city of Cottonwood, this meets two of our key elements that we're discussing right now, and we've got a lot of people talking about wanting to do. I understand, and and this is not illegal, and and it's being talked as if it's illegal. This is not illegal. This is a drug, this is a, a medical drug that's being produced in Arizona, or in, Arizona in, the, in the Cottonwood. I think it's beneficial to our community. I think that if we stand up here and say it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, then that's what the community hears. If we stand up here and say this is good, this is economically viable for the community, it's a sustainable, it's job oriented, it brings, it brings uh, high paying jobs that we don't have right now to our community, and it's legal. Those are the things I think we should be looking at. Uh, and, and to limit the size, we all know what that is. We're trying to run them out of town. And I don't think that's appropriate at all. Okay? I'm, I am definitely supportive of our police force and all that, and I'm supportive of our manager. But I think that there, we shouldn't be looking at scare tactics. We should be looking at the benefit for the community. And if there is a uh, perception that this is bad, you know, we, we need to overcome that. This was voted on by our, by our state. It was passed. 
and we talk about it, well, now we get more heroin, now we get more cocaine. That's not, be that's not because we voted for medical marijuana. That's because we have criminals and we have people that are really bad trying to influence our country. And until we stand up and make those people go away, which we have done with this marijuana, because they used to sell us marijuana at a significant uh, value to them, now we've taken that out of their hands. You know, these people are not good people. These people are ISIS that are bringing these drugs into our country. We don't want to support them. We want to support people that are here, that are paying taxes, that are employing people. That's what we're trying to do with this. I, you know. Uh, limiting the size of this will have one definite uh, uh, outcome. They will leave and then we will miss out on something that we've been prom trying to promote for years. Thank you for time and thank you very much. Okay so I saw one other person you know I just always want to listen to the people that well, want to no, talk. I apologize really but that's how I am. <laughs> I'm just saying we do have a whole nother meeting to go through yeah. here. Okay. I mean, we can stay here till 11, and, and, and this we're not going to vote on this. No, that's I, I understand. It's simple. We're not going to do it. I think it seems like everyone that wanted to speak has been able to speak. I, I just have one, one, one question. For example, if, if your business needed more product and you weren't capable of growing it uh, yourself here, okay, is it... Is, is it legal to go and buy from someone else? That yes, sir, is it is. The, the state system allows for the dispensary here in Yavapai to purchase wholesale from any of the dispensaries, excuse me, any of the cultivation centers across the state of Arizona. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so, just, Mr. Ilinski? Not to upset Mr. Hardy, but no, I just I'm not upset, to... I'm hungry. <laughs> 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 I just, just in, in response to some of the things we've heard tonight, I, I think the city, and I commend our planning department for seeing the writing on the wall. I think we all saw the writing on the wall. I think we all know that this is going to pass recreationally, and it's going to probably sweep the nation. And, you know, it, we have to look forward, and I think the city of Cottonwood did a good job looking forward and recognizing that this was going to pass as medical marijuana. That's why we decided to encourage a, a, a grow facility here in Cottonwood so that we could regulate it more heavily as opposed to having anybody willy-nilly growing pot in their closet or in their basement across Cottonwood, that would really be a, a, a real nightmare for law enforcement. So I, I'm not, I don't like your business. I don't, I don't like your, I don't like it. But, you know, I do see the writing on the wall, and, and I know I, we have to adapt as a council. It's our job. We have to serve the people. It's our job. And if the people have voted this in, then it's our job to adapt. And, and do the best we can for those people. And, and, and I think the perception of marijuana will change. It's, it's just, you know, we say it's not any more harmless than, than alcohol, and I agree with that. I, you know, I, personally, I don't see the difference between drinking alcohol and smoking marijuana. I think they're equally as harmful to a person and, and to society. And it, it, it's just funny that tonight we approved nine or so tasting, uh, you know, liquor license applications for folks to drink alcohol on Main Street, and yet we're, we're fighting this. You know, it's, to me, it's just, it's just one and the same. And uh, it doesn't mean I agree with it. I don't agree with any of it, and I don't like your business. I'm sorry, but it's just I'm, I'm trying to adapt. I see writing on the wall. I give the person time out and wash the wall and send them on their way. <laughs> so I don't look at the writing on the wall. I understand. Okay, so with that, thank you everyone for your comments. It is the first reading. Um, Deputy Clerk, please read ordinance number 616 by title only. Ordinance number 616, an ordinance of the Mayor and City Council of the City of Cottonwood, Yavapai County, Arizona, amending section 308, medical marijuana facilities, subsection C, three medical marijuana cultivation facilities and medical marijuana infusion facilities of the city's zoning ordinance. Madam Mayor. Thank you. Claims and adjustments? Move to pay claims. Second. So Mr. Garrison made the motion to pay the claims. The vice mayor seconded it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Pay the claims. I move to adjourn. The mayor made the motion. The vice mayor seconded it. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We're adjourned.